All right, welcome, folks. It's 6.30. Those of you who are trickling in, let's find some seats. And, uh, all right. I'd like to call to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting of March 18th, 2024. This meeting is being held both in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk before your item is called. Only in-person participants may donate or accept donations of time. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to comment on is called. And of course, commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Leonard. Here. Commissioner Peek. Here. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Perfect timing. Commissioner Smith. Here. Vice Chair Mazza. Here. Chair Hill. Here. You have a quorum. All right. Who would like to lead the Pledge of Allegiance? Commissioner Smith. Here we go. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Why is everybody so shy? Everybody's in the back. <laughs> there won't be that much fur flying. Um, all right, and uh, the agenda, we're, we're seeking an approval here. I know I'd like to rec make at least one recommendation, and I just heard there might be another one. Um, so, so I will uh, uh, make the, I'll make the motion that we Approve the agenda as staff recommends with 4A, move to a date uncertain. It's my understanding that the staff recommends 5A to a date uncertain or a dirt certain? Y yes, staff recommends continuing that until April 15th. Do I have the second, second meeting? April, I want to make sure I have the date right. April 15th, and the reason being is of the correspondence received around lunch today from a neighbor of the property. This would give us the opportunity to look into the uh, biological report that they submitted and the issues raised in their letter. And then you had another one, Craig? Uh, yeah, I'd, I would like to suggest that that we split the city outreach component and we hear from staff uh, for what, what they want to tell us and, and let them let them do it at the time on the agenda, but then move the, our discussion to the end of the evening so that we can get through the precision and everything we need to do with on the serious items because I think the outreach discussion should be a little bit more freewheeling and open-ended and we could be a little bit tired by that point and it wouldn't matter so much. And if a couple people needed to leave, at some point we'd still have a quorum of three. We could keep talking about it a little bit. Just oh. seems like we could get more ideas out that way. I, uh, I, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, Rebecca? If I could, uh, we do have our deputy city manager here along with our outside consultant, Tri Pepe. I don't believe we have them for the full evening. Um, that's why we scheduled them so early in the meeting. And that's yeah. why I suggested splitting it so they could make whatever presentation or whatever. And then they, they, could, they could look at our they have to, it's, it's for us to talk to them. Yeah. Right. And they could, we could have a conversation. They could watch the video. Well, yeah. I, I prefer not to do it that way. We can take a vote. Um, I think the public watches early. Everybody watches early. We've just eliminated an item that was going to take enough time to where 
I think possibly we, we do it correctly. This is the most important thing to happen to Malibu in 20 years. Right, which is why I thought it would be good if we could take some time with it. But well, um, we can. All right. Well, okay, we'll but uh, uh, if you, uh, I will make the motion without that. And, well, um, fine. And then you can. I, I mean, you I, can I, adjust. I'm, I'm making the motion to to 4A and 5A, 4A to a date uncertain, 5A to April 15th, which is tax day, which is sucks. And uh, um, and then Skyler. Uh, I'm not going to second it because I think that I'm a little confused on 5A as to the reason for us changing it is simply because of staff's recommendation when it sounds like with the information that we have in our packet and that we received today that we should be able to get into some of that stuff tonight and if we have to continue it we have to continue it at that point if we feel that there's not enough information. Well so, we don't have an answer from well, what we received today. Can, can we ask staff is does that seem plausible to you to kind of get into it and see how far we get? Or is there something categorical about it where you just feel like it would be preferable to, to hold off for some reason? It's up to the commission of what they would like to do this evening. Uh, my recommendations based on if there are questions that come up about that correspondence, we are not going to be prepared to answer them. We have the information, of course, off of the Edith Reed report. Uh, I did read the correspondence that came in today, and, and uh, you know, to me, the major point that I would like to have time for us to review is to go through the, I believe it was an ecologist who wrote a comment letter about some of the trees in the riparian. Uh, if it's in the commission's interest to have answers about that, that would be the purpose of the continuance. Okay. It's in my comments, interest. Uh, Dennis? I guess my feeling is on this, Director, is um, these polls and all this stuff's been out in the public for quite a while. And then we get these letters, as we always do, later in the afternoons like this. And I, I feel I'm ready mm -hmm. to talk about this particular project. I met with the owner, and um, he's, uh, geez, they want to move here. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm prepared to go. Well, I, I just want to make a comment. There are, there are items in this letter which show that the two different parties have been John, treated differently I, I by staff. In, I don't think we should yeah. get into And that the is something yeah. they're yeah. not prepared. Okay, I think, I think let's, let's yeah. I'll second John's motion for the sake of a vote. Yeah. Um, and if, are, is there a reason to move 5A an hour? And can we discuss that later in the evening? And then if we need to continue, we continue it. Is there anything wrong with that? I think we just heard from Richard that he feels like we're likely to have questions that they can't answer. I, well, I, of course I, you don't. I, I think that might be true. Personally, I think okay. that might be okay. true. Okay, that's fine. Then go for a roll call. Um, roll call, please. Quick clarification. Yeah. Mike. Are 4A and 5A? Mike. Mike. Sorry. Are the two items combined? No. No, okay. they're, they're not combined. Okay. They're separate okay. items. Okay. Um, so, but his motion is to continue item 4A to a date uncertain, item 5A to April 15th, 2024. Um, Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Chair Hill? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? No. Commissioner Peek? No, no. Commissioner Smith? Well, okay, we have two different things here, can't we? we to right, me, you can't put them together, yeah. so it's you, no. You can, no, you can yeah. make it a no for Correct. this, so, so and you, then you make said, a new yeah. motion. So Commissioner Smith, that uh -huh. now is a no vote? Uh, he made a no vote. You have to make a, a subsequent Got motion. It. So motion fails through. To approve the agenda to, removing item 5A, but keeping 5, or keep removing 4A, continuing 4A, to, but to be able to discuss 5A, and if it so deems that that needs to be yeah. continued, there's there's to be no continued. need for that. All the motion would simply be yes. staff's recommendation with... 4A yes. being continued to a date uncertain. Would be Correct. Motion. Thank you. Roll call. Uh, hang on. Do I have a second? Oh. Yeah. It's a second. <laughs> Thank you. And did you want to say something first, Patrick? Nope. I was going to ask for the second oh, as well. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peake? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? Yes. Vice Chair Mazza? No. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries.
Okay, uh, so we've approved an agenda. May I ha have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on March 8th, 2024. All right, thank you. Uh, having no ceremonial presentations, we're on to item 2A. Written e excuse me, we actually do have a ceremonial presentation this evening. Oh. A 1A. I I'm, I'm reading off of, never mind what I'm reading off. I'm <laughs> 1A, here we go. Um, City-owned vacant land outreach presentation. Um, and this is uh, staff contact Alexis Brown. I don't know who, who, is, who is giving it to us. Hello, uh, Chair Hill. Uh, my name is Alexis Brown. I'm the Deputy City Manager for the City of Malibu. Um, <laughs> good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Um, thank you for allowing us uh, to participate in tonight's Planning Commission meeting. Uh, we are here tonight, just as you said, to provide a presentation related to the city-owned vacant land, uh, the five parcels of which um, are within your packet. I am joined by Allie Nichols, representative of Trepepe Smith & Associates, uh, which is the consulting firm that is uh, working with the City of Malibu on the outreach and engagement related to this project. Um, as the Planning Commission, you have been identified as a stakeholder group uh, of this project. It's our intent this evening uh, to go through seven questions which were in your agenda packet. Uh, this is to shape um, the outline of the outreach plan uh, for the community engagement strategy. Um, so, so that is the intent of tonight. It is, uh, that's the the sum of the presentation, if you will. Um, but we're gonna go through each of these questions one by one, and this is for the first portion of the outreach and engagement in relation to city-owned vacant land, and we will be able to provide additional detail or context as we go through those. Um, it can be as detailed and robust a conversation or as, as brief as you would like it to be. So we're, we're excited to shape this part. Our deliverable for this portion of the uh, contract is the end of March. We'll, we'll have the final um, outreach plan uh, that will be available for you to review. And then we will start engagement with the community groups out in Malibu. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Allie. Hi, thank you. Um, introduce, so, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, I'm Allie Nichols. I'm a business analyst with Trepepe Smith & Associates, and I'm serving as the project manager for this outreach project. Um, our first question for you tonight is, based on your knowledge of the Malibu community, which two to four outreach tactics do you feel would best garner the most participation possible? Um, some examples of that are social media content, community workshops, print advertising, um, just anything you could think of that would get as many people involved. Okay, thanks. So let me just say, I, I know I myself have notes on each of these individual items, or I'm assuming you're, we're all kind of on similar process. So... Are we doing one at a time? We're doing, yeah, we're starting with number one. And, um, I, you know, I think let's try to get our ideas on the table and uh, if there's some debate or, or discussion in depth, we can get into that, but maybe people, like Dennis, let's start at, at your end and just see, like, what, what's, your, what's your first take off, leading off comments on number one? Well, I think, sorry. Um, I, I do read our, our paper once a week, though. Um, I, I do believe Mr. Letts gives us a lot of information on the radio, so um, along, along those lines, um, I listen to him every morning, and um, I think he's very important to our community. Um, some social media, but uh, mostly that, uh, the paper, and then I think Hans is, is uh, w one of our best uh, uh, voices. All right, you, you may have more to say, but let's just kind of get a little bit out and then we can. Nice plug for KBU. Skyler. <laughs> um, I think that it's probably in the best interest to use the newspaper, those resources, to direct people to in-person presentations and workshops. That would be my suggestion. Um, I worked very hard to get our city to get that land, and I'm very happy about that for our community. I think that's a really positive thing, so I, uh, that would be my suggestion. And I think that in person with many different community members is gonna have a project take shape, and that'll be awesome. 
Drew. Definitely um, the workshop avenue would be highly recommended um, and lots of advertising through social media. Um, Radio Malibu is always a great source to getting input in regards to what's going on in the city and I know a lot of people uh, rely on it. All right, John. Well, I, I take, I sort of take Drew's take, but uh, in-person meetings are the most important. Getting the people who don't go to meetings to come are the most important. So I would have you look at the needs assessment done in 2015 and see, for example, our, our, our median age is 58. We have 7% children. But if you held meetings, you'll get 58% children and 7% old people. Uh, so you have to go out and approach the people who are going to use the services so it's not biased. And uh, Malibu's a transient community. I recommend against using the newspaper and against KBU for outreach. Uh, use them for to get people to come in. But um, I would I would doubt that 20% of the people in Malibu read the Malibu Times, uh, and I'd guess 5 to 10% listen to KBU. Uh, so we need to have something that is much more obvious, and it has to attack specific groups, homeowners, uh, civic associations, chamber of commerce, et cetera, uh, aimed at the people who you don't think are going to come. You're going to get soccer players and skateboarders and those kind of people. Okay, Drew has a comment? To say, um, I know when Malibu has like senior citizen workshops and um, <clears throat> those type of programs, the actual physical mailers to the community is would be a strong one also. All right, so echoing kind of what we've heard a bit already, I, I would just sort of clarify that community meeting is not so much an outreach tactic, but it's what the outreach is meant to advertise. And sort of looking ahead to number two here, but I think sadly the newspaper ad is maybe the glo most global option, despite John being true that it doesn't reach many people. I think social media platforms are probably too fractured unless you could really cover a lot of different platforms, and I don't know if that's good bang for buck. I would add a category in the, in the advertisements or however the ad outreach does that directs people to sign up for email notifications. The same way we have, you can sign up for however many dozens of different categories of things you want to hear about. Promote that heavily because you can be sending out emails to people saying, yeah, the next meeting is five days from now, all that kind of stuff. Um, reminders, right? And, and possibly, I don't know how this would work, but maybe you could borrow or somehow wrangle in email lists from uh, third party groups like homeowners associations or uh, there may be some legal issues, privacy issues there. But, or the, the, the library speaker series, for example, the library has a, a big outreach. We could maybe piggyback on that. Any other comments on number one? Um, I just to kind of reiterate, I, I think the other thing like Drew mentioned, like a direct mailer to all the residents is not a bad idea, but all of that, I think that all the sort of different things that are referenced in here should probably all direct people to participate in those in-person yeah. meetings. Yeah. I think that would, I don't know what, you know, that, well, that would be my, my best suggestion. And that's question two, I think now, the, the structure, what, what are the meetings that you want to fr frame it for us? Yeah, um, so that's great. You guys have already touched on this. So for these in-person or community meetings um, to gather input, um, we're first wanting to see if you have a sense um, if average would be higher at a virtual meeting, an in-person meeting, or if a hybrid is necessary. Skyler? I think you're going to be most successful in person while you may get more people to tune in virtually. Like, I would maybe... If you can present the option of someone being able to tune in virtually, but then you're probably going to want to encourage the in-person participation. Like, or if you're doing a, per, a meeting here, that meeting could be recorded and then available online. Um, yeah, that John? would be my oh. suggestion. I think it's just hard to get the 
the input. I think that people are better suited being here in person. Um, I think Skyler's right. I think you should have in-person meetings and then have broadcasts. Uh, we, the main thing is not to bias it. A lot of people in Malibu don't use tech. We have a hard time with Zoom, knowing whether somebody's there or not because we don't do two-way. And uh, so you're going to bias the, the, the input to a certain crowd. And there's a lot of things that need to be shown visually when you're describing these properties that doesn't cut it on Zoom, I don't think. It's, it's really hard to do. Uh, Believe it or not, a lot of people in East Malibu never come to West Malibu, and West Malibu never goes to East Malibu, so they don't know what Las Flores Park looks like, and they never heard of Trancas Park. So uh, they have to sort of have some visuals to let them look at it. We had a meeting a while ago where they, the city set up a whole bunch of tables. It was the, uh, the meeting on the sea rise, and that was very effective because you could go around and look at each different area. Why not? Let me just pitch in on that note, too. Uh, well, let, let me catch back up to that note. Let me just first say on item number one, the radio is problematical because it only reaches about half the city. It does not e reach the east end of the city yet, unfortunately. Um, so I think structurally it might make sense to have one or a couple in large in-person meetings at first that are uh, largely educational, kind of laying out on the table what, what's in front of us for the community to understand what the options might be. Then and over a period of multiple meetings and, and several months, to be able to step back and have some opportunity to have some smaller group meetings, whether it's in person or in a Zoom, and you can actually, on Zooms you can set up Zoom rooms where you can have like 10 people or however many people go. So it, it becomes more like a, a, a voting caucus process like they do in Iowa where people can sit around and, and kind of discuss different options in a way and work it out. And then towards the end of the process, bring that back to the group meeting, the, the all city meeting, when people have had time to digest it and talk to their neighbors and their family and. The, the sort of preferences sort of shake out. Like, the, it has to percolate through the city, and I think that takes multiple meetings. Learning something here all in a mass, going away, being able to talk about it and work things out, and then coming back. Or site visits. Or site, site visits, those would be good. And I think for especially, well, for all the meetings, the visual aids are gonna be really important to have nice big pictures of the parcels that uh, maybe not even necessarily, on the, or at least be able to hand the pointer to somebody so they can say, this one here, there, I want the, I'd like a building here, there. Um, likewise, whiteboards, I think this kind of gets to what John was saying about how it's nice to have it be, feel more like a workshop and less like a talk, right? John? Yeah, I want to disagree a little bit on that in that a lot of things in Malibu are seen by the general public as fixed. And certain groups have more power than other groups. And I think having closed meetings is a very bad idea, okay? Have every meeting be open. You can invite groups, but have them all open. Uh, I also think that it would pay, since this is a long process, and you're talking tens of millions, not ones or twos, or hundreds of millions. Um, that it would not hurt to do a, say, a 10-page little booklet showing the, the different parks and the sizes and et cetera so people have something to refer to. For example, what you gave us tonight, to me, to the average person, is worthless because, for example, the triangle parcel, it's an MTA parcel, it's not us. Uh, the the uh, Chili Cookoff parcel has an acre and a half of parking. The Heathercliff has two acres of parking. People need to know this when they say, oh, I want to put something here, and you've got to put parking there. Or you have some other agency who actually controls that property. And so those should be shown on here. And, and so, for example, the dog, the, the uh, little park up behind the shopping center. It's got restrictions on it, but it's got big advantages. The big advantages, 
unlimited parking. Okay? Well, they don't know that, so they look at this and go, there's a tiny little thing on the side of a hill. It should say un unlimited parking as a bonus, and the other one should say two acres are taken and things like that on them. Uh, and the only way to do that is to have some kind of reference guide, I think. Also, I think you could have displays in the uh, upstairs lobby of take a look at this while you're hanging out, and maybe the library also. We've usually used the library for things like that. I, I should clarify, I'm not talking about private meetings at all. I'm talking about work groups that might happen uh, if maybe the big meeting is in here and it's like, okay, let's break into half a dozen smaller groups in the, you guys over here and you guys here, a couple in the multipurpose okay. room, to, so people can go and, and really hash things out and then come back and maybe maybe even appoint like sort of a four person for each group, like a, you know, a jury four person and, and say, you know, come now represent, summarize what your group came up with for, the, for all the other groups, some kind of Big picture, but but some opportunity to get into details too. Um, more on on number two. How about number three? I'll yeah. start off. I I, I think said let's while hear, you're doing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there certain days of the week or times of the day that have historically led to the most attendance for these sort of in-person meetings? And I would say that our standard procedure is usually, we usually have a, 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 some kind of weekend meeting for people who work, and we usually have evening meetings no earlier than six, uh, but not too late so little kids can come to those. And those are well attended usually. Dennis, you got a thought there? Yeah, I was thinking whenever there's an open bar, I think that <laughs> a lot of people will probably come to our community uh, uh, things and uh, quite a bit. No, I think I think um, I think if you can if you can get everybody to show, you know, we we've got Monday nights kind of tough. Um, actually, I have to agree with vice chair. I think probably, um, you know, a weekend meeting is a lot easier and um, with families and trying to figure out what the, with the kids and what you're going to do and if you can bring them and where we where we hold them if there's you know stuff that the kids can do but um, well, it, it's just that if you wherever you, whenever you can get them I guess we just have to figure a day but probably a weekend day I would just if you're gonna shoot is the weekend just be sensitive of you know kids in school and breaks and you know AYSO and baseball and all those other fun things. So you know, I wouldn't try to schedule a weekend meeting. Um, and I would also try to maybe try to focus on it like being in the fall. It seems like a lot of people are home that are actually residents here in the fall um, as opposed to summer or, uh, you know, sometimes even later on in the school year, in December and whatnot, and spring break and all that. Yeah, I don't do it in August. Or... No, but I think but I think that like you're you're. you're Mid September through October, into November, begin or middle of November is wise. Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, probably a mix of evenings and weekend, and uh, you know I don't know exact numbers, but I sort of feel like you might want to have th maybe three uh, sort of informational meetings, and then have some meetings where there's more workshop, several of those at least. And then some later meetings where that can all kind of people can bring their stuff together. So I don't know. You might be talking six or ten meetings total. That would be over several months anyway. John. Yeah, I just and also realize we're 21 miles long, so we should have a meeting. Consider this the south end of town, and consider the high school the north end of town. But you should have at least one general meeting at each end of town. I I would like to you now. Well, we're getting now to the next question, aren't we? Uh, number four. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay, I, tell, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't read that. No, that's great. They, it's natural progression. Um, f do you have any recommendations on ideal locations for these in-person meetings? So the different areas of Malibu where people will be at. And this can be for the scheduled ones and also for pop-up meetings or like you were saying, to go out into the community. Some good ideas for that as well. I think you're sitting in a great place 
for a location for a lot of those meetings. But I also think that like if you're going to go site specific, you know, like you could pro a lot of people could park at Heathercliff and you could do a meeting there outside with some tents during the day. You know, um, you could do the same thing down here in Cross Creek. Some of the other parcels maybe have like you know, or you could do one up Trancus, right? But the triangle probably has a little bit more of a restriction on that. And then the one over by uh, the former La Paz project or Mount Ranch, whatever, I don't know what they're calling it. I, I would say that um, for some of the informational stuff and some of the sort of more workshoppy stuff, it might make sense to have a location in east and west. But in the end, this has to be a unified all city move that's focused really here. Uh, that this is where the main main coming together happens because it, it doesn't help if you have a group on the west side saying yeah we want a pool at Heathercliff and a group on the east saying, side saying yeah we want a pool at Las Flores or then then where have we gotten it, ha it has to be a decision made by the whole city as a collective well I, I just want to comment on that it was another comment I had but um, you have to look at the census data and the demographics because the center of Malibu is Sycamore Park. It's seven miles from here. But we, okay. we don't have an auditorium like this. In no, I, Park, no, no, but we do have a high school up in that general area. But what I'm saying is, in general, the whole plan has to look at where people actually live. And uh, it's never really been that way in Malibu. The, the, uh, the other thing you may want to work with is Parks and Rec does hikes at some of these parks. And you can have... They'll probably put on a hike at, say, someplace like Trancus, where half the people haven't been. Uh, you want to see what the park could be? Here's a hike. You, you, you only may get 30 people show up, but you will get interested people showing up. And if not City Hall, maybe there's a meeting option for, for one of the big ones at the college auditorium. I, I think City Hall is probably fine. What if college? It's, if it's too big. Santa Monica College. Right, oh. right here, right, right down the this street. It's just big. Yeah. But, okay. I'm, I'm just saying, if if this is too booked, or you know, that maybe that would be something a backup option. Maybe I don't know. Um, uh, number five, are we on two, two now? Question five. Yes. Um, so during the feedback process, during like the 2012, 2015 period, do you recall any community groups or organizations that were not actively involved or engaged? I think it's hard to say because like during that time period, all the land that the city has now wasn't in the city's possession. So I don't wouldn't say that maybe they're were not a part of it, but maybe it wasn't like their target, right? So there was a much different set of things that the city was looking at at that time. So I just think it'd be important now to, you know, get like the various HOAs. And I think that planning or some city staff members will have that information. Um, and I think all of the, you know, different like youth sports through the uh, community services division of the city, it'd be very helpful. But I, I think that at some point during this, once you kind of outline those things, that getting like a direct mailer to every house in the city, you know, not just like this like straight throwaway card, but like, you know, a nice thing that has a good amount of information and is a would be a good suggestion. Uh, the group that got missed the most at that one was the, the older group. Uh, it was mostly the sports groups that came. Uh, because it was mostly uh, plus park and the older groups and the service groups and the business groups didn't really participate and we had one meeting where we had uh, little yellow tags you stuck on what you wanted 80% of them went for a skate park so uh, that's the group that showed up that night are you thinking about picking up your skateboarding career, John? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that if you get it in Malibu, if you get if you get a focus group and you get 50 people, uh, you win. Okay, 50 people is a lot here to, to participate. So that's why you have to kind of get people who normally don't participate. Um, it could be, by, by the way, there's certain community events that happen where you may want to tie them together. Like, for example, uh, the farmer's market. 
they get a big crowd. You could have the same day, you could have at the college right next door. Come see what we're, come tell us what you're planning between one and two or something like that. Because you already have the people there. Let, let, me, let me interject here. I don't see a good question about what tools we're talking about, whether it's going to be a survey, a multiple choice, a website form. And I, I think that's maybe something you're trying to decide here now. But my, my recollection of that past process, the one memory that I have strongly now is that there was a lot of multiple choice on it. And I remember looking at the items and thinking, all right, on this one, I would choose two of these. And on this one, it's none of the above. And there's something else. And so, I, you know, if, if, we, if there's going to be any sort of like survey instrument like that, I think, A, it should be informed by the early meetings where people show up and they can, you can kind of get on the table. What are some of the ideas that are going to fly or that really aren't going to fly and kind of narrow it down that way so when you do have an instrument that gets more widely shared, it's, it's a, a little bit more focused by the community's desires and intents already, right? And, and it should have some kind of write-in form on if, if it is multiple choice at all, which I don't really like, but I, you know, I know we have to kind of pin things down, then at least some kind of write-in option to other. other, allow some discretion for people to elaborate and not just feel like they're ticking a box. John? I also think you should put some demographic information on it. Um, how old are you? No, not their names. How old are you? What end of town do you live on, et cetera? Uh, because, uh, for example, we had a, uh, a survey a while ago for an art center. It came out 95 to 95 to 5. Okay, well, it's obviously not a scientific survey. 95% of the people don't ever agree on anything unless they're a group. So we need to make sure that that doesn't get... And you have to also watch out for stacking. People will vote 5 to 10 times for certain things. Uh, are we on to next question? Next question. Yeah. Um, what are some keywords or common phrases that the community already uses or attributes to this project um, that you've seen prompt engagement? So, like, some things we've heard are vacant lands, vacant lots, future Malibu. What do you guys hear in the community as people refer to these parcels? This is question six. Vacant lands, vacant lots. I'm going to disagree and go more with Malibu's future, but <laughs> um, I, don't know, I think you got to work on that with how you're going to phrase that, you know? I, I've got a few thoughts. Malibu's current okay. vacant future, non-vacant future. I don't know. <laughs> Plan your future. Help uh, design Malibu. Um, talk about community facilities. You could contrast whether uh, there could be a question about preferences about building community facilities versus preserving open space, which might include a park or something. Just, I caution the word facilities. Like when we say facilities, people in our community sometimes they think like, oh my gosh, what's going to, yeah. you know, that's I, like. It's like, how do you, how, what, what are words that yeah. encompass a park or a culture center or a museum or a sports or, you know, it's a lot well, of different things. Yeah, but the, the other thing is, as somebody mentioned, nothing or not or preserve okay. open space so i yeah. think you're better off saying plan your future plan our help plan our future i, I wanted our, to i wanted to say there's no need to use the word future because we're not contemplating doing anything in the past right this is all like it, uh yeah but to people in malibu have seen what's happened in the last 10 years i too. think it might be more useful to try to distinguish and get the pulse of what things would people like to see done like now versus things that would be great to see but they don't want to see for you know, 10 or 15 years might be okay. Or just let some, some sense of, like, what are their priorities? Um, well, that, that counts finance, too. And, and, and I'm, I'm slicing it kind of thin here now, but I, I would prefer not to use the word vacant because it implies that building something there is the preferred or inevitable state. And I would prefer using the words land or parcel over the word lot which also sort of implies that it's a site specifically for building on. Um, so but that, use, that's, use, I'm slicing it thin now. You can use the word open space, uh, but 
Um, Sounds like you're going back to the drawing board on that. You, you want to you want to also consider what the city needs as far as facilities. For example, a tow yard. Okay, people aren't going to go out there and say, "Gee, I want a park," and why don't we throw a tow yard in? Yeah. I mean, that's got to be in the mix somewhere. Okay, that's got to have some kind of priority. These these what they actually need for and and then there's. This gets down into the weeds, maybe too much, but there's certain financing ability that we have that can determine the uses of certain land. For example, example, anything on the west side could you get a free $22 million facility. They can't in the center of town through the library funds. And so that puts a bias on certain lots versus other lots. Question seven. All right. Um, ideally, how long do you think that the outreach process should last in order to demonstrate that we have tried to get as much participation as possible? When they stop fighting. <laughs> we've, we've talked about that some already. You know, at a certain point, you're, you're going to, as, as a, as a uh, expert on this, you're going you're to know that the, the sports people played their, said their thing and the Arts people have said their thing, and the open space people have said their thing, and the community services people have said their thing, and they're going to be getting tired. Then you, what you really got to watch for, again, is what you've said, is finding the people who haven't spoken up. What have we missed? And that's why I think you should go back and look at the priority list from 2015, because there are a lot of things that got actually put on there from our surveys that nobody ever talked about. Uh, and there are things that people would use. Yeah, I think it's just uh, probably said it already, but it's most important for it to be iterative and have an opportunity for ideas to percolate around. A lot of things won't occur to people until they hear them from someone else and they have to think about them and talk about them. And so there's got to be like, I think I said it. Okay. I, I don't know what the direction is exactly from council on what the timeline is for you guys, but. I would hope that by middle of November next year, you could be wrapping up whatever you've started. So if it takes a few months to get that stuff in place and maybe you start that outreach end of the summer, early fall, you know, by Thanksgiving time, you're kind of wrapping that up and that's maybe like a two and a half to three month process. So you're talking this November, not, yeah. not next year. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we can get something done. Yeah, okay, I thought you we said next year. I, I think you, you have to look at it as things move real well. We've had this vacant land for, what, five years? Nobody's done squat. So d do it right and get it moving and uh, try to not have to do it again. Because it's going to be 10 years before a lot of stuff gets done, and then they're going to want to do it again. That's why I, I want to stress that you look at the future demographic trends of Malibu, because these things are going to be built 5 to 10 to 15 years from now, and it's going to, it has radically changed in the last five years. Yeah. Radically changed. Down with Dennis. I, I was just thinking, uh, and this kind of goes with everything, I think. Um, if you can find out who who's involved at which part of town, as Vice Chair said, I think it's very important that you try and bring people in from the east side, um, maybe a Lloyd Ahern to talk to him, and maybe you can find out who's the center of town and who people that come to our meetings are involved that you see here, um, that we see here and from the West End. Um, just, I don't know, maybe find a few of the people that, that are involved as they come to us or, or watch us, even city council meetings, and then get a hold of them. And when, as uh, Commissioner uh, Hill said and Vice Chair said, and maybe in, the, in these discussions, in these smaller discussions, you've got a good group of people from all over town, so everybody understands what you're doing, not just, you know, the West End, they got that table. Well, now you, you've got to put everybody together the best you can. Yeah. And I don't, I, that's the only thing I can think is trying find the folks that, that are involved or do stuff for us, with, with us. The other oh, thing I think John, you should John, consider. John, uh, Rebecca, I, I saw a little finger there. I'd just like to ask a quick 
process question. We don't typically take public comment during presentations. We do have hands raised in the virtual meeting, and I'd like to know what your pleasure is on that. Uh, well, I would say let's save them for 2A. Perfect. They Thank can, you. you guys are, you'll stick around for a few minutes and hear that, right? So, yeah. Uh, uh, I think also it's very important. A lot of the people in Malibu do not realize what's available here. And uh, not necessarily the city. I mean, for example, Pepperdine's building a 5,000-seat auditorium, basketball court. <laughs> but uh, we don't necessarily, with a town with 9,500 people, don't necessarily have to duplicate everything. And so we, sh we should have at least, the public should at least understand that there's 10, say, I don't know how many, there are 10 tennis courts here. There's a X here, there's an X there, and, and we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Because we're only, this should be for the people of Malibu. One of the things that killed the aquatic center was it became regional. And then it all blew up. Cost way too much money and way too much staff to have a regional center. That, that leads me to, I had a couple questions that I thought would be helpful to consider at some, in some way. And on that note, figure out which parcels, this is for people to think about, which parcels, if any, should be relatively more visitor serving, for example, a visitor center, an art gallery, or a museum versus things that are ver relatively more resident serving, like a, a park or a pool or staff housing or, you know, whatever the ideas are. And, and the, there are a couple things that, are, that cross the line, like a performance space might be resident serving and visitor serving. But to ask, to kind of get a sense of, are, are we doing this, how much are we doing this for residents versus so 100% we for residents. Right, well, so, yeah. so, so then you're sort of saying we don't need a visitor center or we don't need a, like some other things like that. Then the other consideration is to, to try to suss out, would the city, would, would people prefer that the city maintain the current commitment to providing the parking lot, all the parking space stuff on the different lots? To what extent might they be interested in shuffling that around if possible, if you could trade the legal deed restrictions of the parking spaces on one lot and put them on a different lot so that you could do something different on, on say, the triangle parcel. Um, versus maybe a third choice in there is, are, is there an option for the city to buy out some of those parking interests? Because, you know, with the whatever million, $100 million or whatever it is right now to say, you know, let's, on this one lot, let, it would be far better if we could do X, Y, or Z and not have to accommodate that parking commitment if we could just buy that out. I don't know how you frame that for people, but that, that seems like that would be something to sort out here. Yeah, if, if you wanted to get less parking for Malibu, that would be a great idea. But uh, especially in the Civic Center. Well, we're, uh, we're, not, we're not deciding. This is for the people. No, I just want to make the, the something that should be added to the whole idea is we have 15 million visitors to go to the beach every year, okay? We're providing entertainment. So I, I, I don't feel sorry for the people in downtown L.A. not having a, a, a sports arena in Malibu. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't bother me at all. And uh, But the people in Malibu can't get out, so they have to have something here. And I, I think that I don't know how you do this, but Nobody in Malibu has ever considered the ocean an official official part of our parks and rec, our recreation, other than a small surf club at the high school. And that should be part of our thought process as far as can any of these parks make that usable more so we don't have to use it, use our our free our land that we paid for, we can use free land. But so, like, you'd have a boat shed where you could check out kayaks to take on the ocean? Or? No, I'd have a way for them to go to the ocean and keep them out of our. All right, now now we're getting into the sub <laughs> we're getting into the substance of what yeah, goes exactly. where. That's not our job tonight. Okay. Um, any other comments? Uh, let me just look real quick because I, I just wanted to say thank you very much to both of you for your time helping our city get through this process. I know it's sometimes it's really difficult, so I appreciate that. 
Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks. I just thank want you. to add two things that you could you could do uh, pretty cheaply. We we own the the uh, banners, the ability to put banners on the highway, and drones cost nothing. You can show these lands on video very easily with a drone versus a little picture like this. Uh, people like that stuff, and you can put that on on social media very easily. You may want to have a YouTube channel for Malibu Parks or something. I don't know. Uh, but it, it makes it a lot more, you can figure out what it is. When you see the triangle parcel, people go, oh, what's that? Oh, you know, where all the orange cords are, <laughs> all the cable is, you know, it's that kind of description, it doesn't work. Done. Okay, all right, thanks again. And uh, you've got your work cut out for you. Um, I think we are now on to, if I'm not mistaken, item 2A, written and oral communications from the public. I have one speaker slip here, and, I, and we've heard there's a few online, uh, just the one speaker slip. That would be uh, Mr. Frank P. Angel. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Frank Angel. Um, when you discussed uh, at the outset of this meeting uh, whether to continue item 5A, um, I heard Commissioner Dennis Smith complain about that people always submit things in the last minute. Is that correct? And <clears throat> I have to respond to that. We got a staff report five days in the evening, five days before this meeting. And at that same time, we were being asked to provide, uh, with a biological consultant, evidence discussing the issues that we raised. So how on earth do you suggest this process can be improved? If we get the staff report two weeks before or a month before, we can do it earlier. But don't accuse the public or members of the public if they have late submissions because the applicant has been discussing this for over a year with staff. And we found out only through the notice. And by the way, your notice violates the Brown Act, so I suggest that you continue this matter uh, so that proper notice can be given because the public notice misdescribes the project. It, it does not include the 900 square foot um, basement in it. So you have to continue it. I urge you, by the way, to agree with staff to continue it, and then you'll have all the time you need to review our documents. Um, but this is a matter, and the city attorney can confirm that, has been decided twice by the third appellate district in Sacramento, and then uh, last year or two years ago uh, by the second appellate district's division six in Ventura. You have to have in your public notice, uh, consistently with the Brown Act, a, 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 a proper and accurate project description, and the project description does not have the basement of 980 square feet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Angel. Now we have some uh, on the Zoom. There are two raised hands. First is Howard Rudsky. Howard Rudsky, can we hear you? Welcome. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. So I'd like to talk about the land and how things are done. I think it's very important that you reach out to places where moms and dads and kids are because a lot of this land is going to be used by moms and dads and kids in the city has an e-blast they have a message blast there are <clears throat> email lists that can be obtained but i think something that you can do is go to the little league go to the soccer teams go to the pta go to the sports groups and make them aware of it. But somewhere where most of us go are all the markets, the restaurants and things like that. If you put a three by five poster in the window or ask them, and then don't just say what it is, say a couple words and then put a link to a very good visual with drones and 3D of the different lots, 
because you guys are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. This stuff now is super inexpensive. Somebody can contact me if they want and I can tell you guys how. Because there should be a rented big screen or something at City Hall where people go there and see it. It should be in other parts of town where people can look at it. And old people, young people, computer literate people, they should be able just to click on a link and see on a mobile device or a computer in a very visual way what's going on. Then they should be directed because that's the biggest problem, knowing where to go, who to talk to, you know, what's going on. Directed to go to certain first meetings, second meetings, third meetings. And like some of you said, there should be questions about each lot because the Cultural Arts Center has done a lot of work for one of the lots. Park and Parts and Rec have done a lot of work for another one of the lots. Use them already. Get their input. And then this should be 30 to 60 day process and let the majority of the people decide what's going to go on these lots and just do it. It's been over a decade. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Rudsky. Who's next? Joe Drummond. Joe Drummond. How are you? Sorry, I'm finishing my taxes and I'm trying to get out of here on Thursday for two weeks. Um, I'm just, I just received an email saying, by the way, that my, I believe my whole entire project, the 69 square foot deck and everything is finally approved. So I'm jumping for joy. I can't believe it. Three years later, thank you. Um, I do also want to comment on the last item. I would like on the record that uh, there's several options you can do to notify the residents. I think the good one would be to put a large sign with a QR code to the options at each site that should be placed on each lot, visible to people who pass by, and viable options that were obtained in the last resident survey should be given in a multiple choice or order of preference, i.e. open space, pool, performing arts center, saying how big, how big, like what size should the performing arts center be, give options there, a community center, a Shumash Museum, Western Library Branch, a dog park, a community park, etc. You can also email similar choice options, or no, not email, mail similar choice options for each lot with a QR code to the survey to each residence, like Skylar was suggesting. This way, all residents would be contacted. And you should also reach out to the schools through the PTSA, the Shark Fund, community organizations, AYSO, Little League, Sea Wolves, Marlins, etc. You can also have flyers being handed out in front of the grocery stores before a few days before a public meeting if you want to get people, to, residents to attend. So I think that having a QR code that people can scan and view all different options for each lot and do the whole drone, beautiful visuals of what each lot could potentially be, that would be a good thing to do. That's all I have to say. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Joe. So I think that's it for uh, item 2A, public comment. That brings us to 2B, commissioner comments. We'd like to go first. I'm just going to say thank you all for being here and let's move on. Dennis, comment? Just want to say happy birthday to my grandson, Christian. He'll turn two next week. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say <clears throat> the public comments tonight in regards to some of the suggestions for the open land, I think we're very good and should hopefully be included. John? Nothing. Uh, okay, a couple things here. First of all, happy birthday, Christian. Um, but, and to be clear on the, um, just to kind of put a bow on this, I don't know that we want to tell people too specifically in the initial stages what the options are, maybe examples, but we want, we want to get those ideas from people in the initial stages. All right. Um, okay, a couple things. One, that we got an email from somebody addressing you in particular, did you want to respond to that? Is that? I wasn't, do, I, I wasn't sure what it was about, yeah, but. I, I wasn't sure either. I was appointed by Doug Stewart, not Marianne, and I'm not exactly sure what the purpose of the email was or the question. Okay. Um, 
Okay, this is gonna sound sort of pedantic, but for staff and I guess for Richard too, the signatures on review sheets, it, it, at the margin it seems like accountability can be sort of fuzzy sometimes. Um, for example, at the last Caltrans meeting, we had a public re works review sheet with an indecipherable signature. Years from now, somebody might not even know who signed it or who to talk to about it. Do, do we need to have some kind of protocol whereby ha people have to print their name? Um, and is it, how permissible is it to just cross out a date that's been signed on a form and write in a new date? Does it need to be initialed? Or how, how do we know a sheet was signed recently? Or, or it, it just feels like we're being a little bit casual with some of these sheets and it's probably normally fine, but when the litigators come up on something, suddenly we might be caught with our pants down. What, 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 what's the, am, am I pointing to thin air here or what do you think? If needed, we can turn to Pat about litigators. Uh, ultimately, the agency that issued it is gonna be the agency held accountable for it, whether it be the fire department, city reviewer, um, the, or the city biologist at that time. Ultimately, it falls on the, the overall uh, <coughs> agency. We can take a look at our internal practices. Um, typically speaking though, there's usually a letter associated with the review and in there they typically have a, type their name out and then sign above the line. Uh, but in some cases, I think probably one of the ones you're getting to is the fire department, which has a number of different individuals, a number of different signatures. It's not a city agency. We don't have control over them. If folks sign uh, something after crossing something out, once again, it would be up to this commission when they're hearing the item if they want to accept it or not. Uh, it's much like a check. If you write the wrong amount on there, you can scratch it out and scribble your initials and a bank is good with that. Um, but I do think probably what you're thinking uh, and what you're noticing is the fire department because they are going through a lot of transition and turnover right now. Uh, they're plan checkers. So we're seeing a lot of names that we've never seen before. Uh, I think McGee. Dennis might be able to help me with oh, this. He's he been was around forever. He's easy to recognize. He takes up the whole page. <laughs> that M starts at the bottom, goes to the top, and back down again. Uh, but that's what we're seeing. And of course, if, if fire department. Uh, we, we can look at it more. Uh, but actually, what I've found is when I have questions, typically if I go to Epic LA or uh, from them, the the their database has the reviewer's name, and I can reconcile. Yeah, fire department, but I, I was uh, specifically, it was a public worksheet that I, I had a question on the Caltrans thing. I was like, I don't even know who I need to talk to about this because I can't tell who, who signed it. Um, John? I just want to add to that. Uh, we get plans that aren't in scale, so we can't scale them. And we get a lot of, I find a lot of times that the architects leave off the dimensions so we can't figure out the size of a room or... Uh, Heights and stuff. So I, I know you guys probably get digital files and you can just push a button and know what everything is. But I, I hope, hopefully, the planner checks and makes sure when we get a, a, a set of prints that there's numbers on them. All right. And uh, did you want to? My only response to that was going to be that we do uh, ask for dimensions on plans and. We'll be glad to, you know, it's a good reminder to make sure that they are showing up, but we do ask for those in addition to the work we do with scaling out the items. Yeah, okay. And then my other comment was, there's still some public confusion about how we handled the Caltrans crosswalk. We, we never denied it. We continued it so we could get data showing that in terms of safety, it was the right project in the right place. And on rehearing it, we approved it not due to some supposed backlash, but because we got the data from Caltrans and we got testimony from uh, the immediate neighbors who knew what was going on there. And that all confirmed that it would likely increase safety. And we also got assurances that the other projects we thought might be a more immediate need were actually in the works too. So uh, this commission, we're not here to respond to political teapot tempests, but we respond to the data and the law, and in the end, I think we produced a decision that could be characterized as a win-win. And uh, we now re return you to your regularly scheduled programming, which is staff. 
Staff uh, comments, please. Uh, the only comment that I have is just to give you an update that we are going to have staff take time to participate in some trainings for new software. As you were mentioning, scaling out drawings. We are getting new software to help us with the transmittal of documents citywide, uh, the plans, so that all departments are looking at the same plans. And then also that same software has the capability of detecting changes between plan set and also just added functionalities uh, for the ability to scale, calculate area, uh, issue stamps, approval stamps. So if you see that the planners are a bit slow in getting back to you, it's because they're going to be participating in some trainings for software we hope makes the process more efficient and more detailed. All right. Thank you. Oh, uh, John. All right. We mentioned a couple of meetings ago about you getting tracking software that you were going to get a couple of years ago. Is is that come along at all? Yes. Um, as much as I hate to say it, it's still a project in the works, but that's where it is. It's uh, our uh, IT staff has been working with us to get basically a citywide permit tracking land uh, land uh, management software, much like you see in some other cities where they're this is the ability for members of the public or the applicant to constantly see where their project is without, you know, they don't have to interact basically with a live person. They could uh, get this information off of the website and, of course, call us. But, yes, that is an ongoing process. Our um, IT folks, um, I want to say that at this point we have a pretty good plan together of what we need. We're working with consultants to get the exact fit and move ourselves more towards a new type of central database that allows for permit tracking um, that makes it easy, like I said, for internal and external. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we on to the consent calendar? Does anybody... Is anything pulled? That's that's the question. Who, who needs to pull anything? I'm going to pull 3B1. So we've got 3B1 to Is pull. Any others? Anything else commented on? Uh, no, we have... Um, 3B1 only if, if needed. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve uh, aside from item 3B1. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Um, I guess we just move ahead on consensus, right? So um, 3B1, what, what, what do you want to talk about, John? Well, we got a letter dated November. Oops. We got a letter dated November 28th asking for an extension. And it ex it's asking for an extension on a project with different numbers. Um, for, exa uh, for example, the, uh, let's see here, the, the garage is 1,647 square feet, and he's asking uh, for 2,094. And the building itself is... Uh, 6697 and they're asking for 7759 square feet in the extension that sounds so like I just wondered why that is staff uh, could you please tell me the page number that you found this discrepancy it should just be approving well, I'm looking the, original. At the description of the project page mm -hmm. number one and I'm looking at paragraph two of the letter dated November 28th 2023 and those numbers don't match. In terms of this time extension, it is just extending the originally approved project. They have not submitted for any changes at this time. If they will be proposing those changes, they will need to submit a substantial conformance, but none has been presented at this time. If the applicant would like to address this uh, request for a later time? Let's see if, the, if Mr. Smith can clarify this for us briefly. Well, now, for the record, Don Schmitz, on behalf of the applicant, uh, the extension request is for precisely the coastal development permit that was approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm caught flat-footed here, Commissioner Mazza. The only uh, explanation I can uh, guess at is that my staff made a mistake in regards to the numbers, uh, but the uh, CDP extension request is 
again, for exactly what was approved by the commission as reflected in the resolution of approval and as shown on the public record. I didn't think you ever made mistakes. I, I didn't write the letter, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the so buck stops where? Uh, I'm, I'm, I move we receive and file. And we have to see if there's any other public comments. Oh. Yeah, we've opened this one, so are there any public comments on this? There's no raised hands. Okay, and I, I would just clarify, do we need to make any notation on the motion that it reflects what he just said, that this is the original approval and not something different as... That's all on the record. Yeah, it, it is all in the, in okay. the resolution. Then that's, then that's all we need. Uh, we need to vote on that, or that's a receiving file, right? Anybody opposed to any of this? We're all no, in we're, consent we're, we're on we're consent? Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mr. Schmitz. Um, wait, 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 wait. wait. Is, yeah, th 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 3B1 is a resolution. It's not a receiving file. Oh, it is? Okay, I move uh, 3B1. 3B1. Okay, uh, roll call, please, Rebecca. We need a second. Uh, I'll second. second. Several seconds there. Okay. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Peake? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Chair Hill? I'm sorry. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. All right. So then we are now on to pass the consent calendar. 4A is continued to a date uncertain, so we're on to 4B. Uh, who is the planner on this one? Renika Brooks back there. Okay, while she's coming up, I will read this. This is um, this is at 28922 Gray Fox Street, Coastal Development Permit Number 21-053, Site Plan Review Number 22-005, and Demolition Permit Number 23-003, an application to demolish the existing single-family residence and construct a new single-family residence, attached garage, attached guest house, and pool cabana, on-site wastewater treatment system, landscaping, and associated site improvements continued from March 4th, 2024. And our case planner for this project is uh, contract planner Rick Caswell, who is joining us remotely. Uh -huh. Aha. Mr. Caswell, are you, are you here with us? I am with you, yes. Uh, I do not believe the video is uh, currently working, but I'm certainly here um, uh, audibly. Well, yeah, we somehow we don't normally do video, so go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, good evening, Chair Hill and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the project description, uh, I'll try to quickly summarize it. It's basically to demolish an existing single family residence and uh, construct a new one um, along with an attached uh, guest house and uh, various uh, site improvements. If I could have the next slide, please. So this was continued from the February 5th, um, 2024 Planning Commission meeting. Um, essentially, uh, staff uh, requested this continuation uh, due to a grading plan inconsistency with a uh, grading exhibit that we uh, were also in possession of. Uh, the grading plan has since been updated by the applicant. Um, a few uh, errors were corrected by the applicant. Um, to quickly summarize those, uh, so several areas have been double counted. Uh, the earthwork model was broken into smaller and more accurate uh, areas there. And then also the foundations were revised uh, to basically uh, have a thickness reduction of four inches going from 12 down to eight, and that reduced the overall grading volume. So that's why we have the, uh, the item before you tonight, as opposed to a few weeks ago. If I could have the next slide, please. So a quick look at the property here. It's uh, really in the sort of center east of Point Doom here. And uh, it's a standard rectangular shaped lot, as you can see from uh, the slide before us. If I can have the next slide, please. So this just gives a uh, very quick overview of what the existing property looks like right now. Uh, it slopes down. Uh, from the front yard down to the rear there. There's about a 30-foot um, elevation differential there um, from, the, from the front yard going down to a uh, ravine in the back there. And uh, currently, there is a uh, almost 1,500-square-foot single-family residence there with a two-story detached guest house. Um, the 
The main residence itself was built back in 1953. I can have the next slide, please. So the project description, we're looking at, um, as I mentioned before, uh, demolition of the existing single family residence with the associated structures that uh, detached uh, guest house there along with uh, some shed structures. They would be constructing a uh, approximately 3,800 square foot single family residence with uh, attached two, two car garage, um, 414 square foot attached guest house um, with a uh, 485 square foot pool cabana below that. There would be a new on site wastewater treatment system, uh, landscaping improvements, and uh, associated outdoor lighting, uh, both uh, you know, on the main residence and also. Uh, for um, landscape lighting. If I could have the next slide, please. This just shows a kind of a simple slope analysis breakdown of the property. Uh, in the blue there is basically uh, less than four to one slopes. So that's the majority of the property and um, essentially where all of the development is being proposed. Uh, the steeper portion of the property at the rear there, um, that is in excess of four to one slopes. So uh, obviously no uh, development is proposed for that, given that Point Doom, um, Escher is essentially considered uh, four to one or steeper for that um, uh, area of Mallow. If I could have the next slide, please. So a quick look at uh, some of the highlights here with um, site plans. We've broken it into two uh, portions of the, the property here. So the front half of the lot, um, you'll see those arrows is pointing to uh, three uncovered spaces. Um, obviously, the, the, the two-car garage uh, that's proposed, that takes care of the unenclosed, or sorry, the enclosed um, uh, parking spaces there, off-street parking spaces. Um, and then uh, for the single-family residents, two uncovered spaces would normally be required. However, because they're proposing a guest house, that's why the applicant is now proposing three um, unenclosed parking spaces there on the property. And you can see a little dashed line outline there. That's the existing single family residence. So you'll notice that that uh, is actually located a little bit closer towards the street there, Gray Fox. Um, the new proposed residence will be located uh, further backwards from that, about six feet um, further uh, towards the rear there. If I could have the next slide, please. And looking at the rear property here, or the rear half of the property, um, so you can see the location of that um, attached guest house there with pool cabana beneath it. And there's also a uh, proposed trellis structure, which would um, be attached to that. You'll also no notice that there's a uh, pool there um, at the, uh, the bottom of the, of the um, slide before us there. That has already been approved. That's a, um, another permit that was approved, um, uh, I believe in 2022. So that um, is, is not part of the scope before you tonight. If I can have the next slide, please. This just gives a quick overview of the, uh, the TDSF um, of the property. So uh, with this one, we can see that there's uh, a maximum allowable TDSF of uh, 7,083 square feet. Um, the applicant is proposing um, just under 6,800 square feet, so it complies with that. If I could have the next slide, please. So looking at the impermeable coverage, again, um, there's a maximum impermeable coverage of 13,365. The applicant is um, approximately 2,000 square feet um, away from that, so they, they are more than meeting the impermeable, the allowable impermeable coverage. If I can have the next slide, please. And then uh, because there is a portion of the property that proposes a uh, second floor, um, that obviously kicks into play the two thirds calculation. Um, as you can see from this, they are uh, more than meeting that two thirds calculation. Um, they're, they're approximately a tenth of what they would normally be allowed um, for the second floor there. If I could have the next slide, please. So this one just shows us the start of the elevations. So we can see that the um, properties uh, or the proposed single family residence is 
primarily going to be a uh, single story. We can see the uh, north elevation. So this is uh, effectively the uh, street facing elevation there. And you will see that it's, it's well within the 18 foot um, allowable height there. Um, at the rear of the property, that's where it does the, the south uh, portion of the property, that's where it does extend above those 18 um, feet in height, and that's obviously why they have a site plan review um, that allows uh, flat roofs up to 24 uh, feet in height. So this particular uh, roof, although it's pitched, would qualify as a flat roof um, because it's, it's essentially not steep enough by uh, the criteria that uh, define pitched or sloped uh, roof. And as you can see from this, it, it still meets that 24 uh, feet for, for a flat um, uh, roof pitch there. If I can have the next slide, please. And then just looking here, we have the west uh, elevation. So this, uh, bear with me, I'm pulling it up on another screen at the same time just to magnify it on, on my end. So, uh, uh, Appreciate your patience with that. Again, this just confirms that height uh, with the, uh, the east elevation there as we look towards a uh, uh, breezeway of the property there at the east elevation with uh, essentially uh, screened breezeway there that counts towards the TDS app. And then we can see uh, uh, the pitch of the roof here, which is at uh, 17 and a half above grade. So that's that's basically sort of a match line of the residence with it being a uh, linear uh, type of structure. So we can see kind of the more north um, portion of the east elevation there up top and the southern portion of the east elevation uh, down below. If I can have the next slide, please. So again, we're looking at the west uh, elevation here. Um, essentially, we're seeing the same thing, uh, just different, uh, different side of the building. We can move to the grading, please. The next slide, thank you. So this just gives an overview of the uh, the updated grading quantities. So there is a uh, maximum allowable uh, non-exempt grading of a thousand cubic yards. The applicant is proposing uh, 379 cubic yards of cut, 224 cubic yards of fill. Um, that's in addition to the 99 cubic yards of non-exempt grading. Uh, that was previously approved um, with the pool um, project. So that takes them to a total uh, non-exempt grading, uh, uh, cumulatively speaking, uh, obviously that's for the uh, course of a, a property being developed uh, under uh, CDPs. So it's still well within the uh, maximum allowable 1,000 cubic yards there with a total of 702. And next slide, please. So far, uh, there has been no um, correspondence received from uh, from members of the public or um, you know any other stakeholder in this process. And if I can have the last slide, please. To that end, um, it's staff recommendation that uh, the Planning Commission adopts resolution number 24-08, approving the project as conditioned. Um, obviously, the uh, conditions of approval are included with the staff report, which um, originally went out and was then augmented more recently with the uh, uh, applicant changes to the grading plan. Uh, I believe the applicant team is available both in person and virtually tonight. So um, I will attempt to answer any questions uh, commissioners may have of me first, and then obviously uh, punt to the applicant where needed. Thank you. All right, thank you, Planner Caswell. Before we get on to any presentation and uh, public comments, can we have disclosures, please, Dennis? None. Tyler? I met with one of the representatives from the project uh, prior to our last hearing when we were to discuss it. True. Um, same with me. I was at the same meeting. Um, I stopped by, and on the one hand, I noticed most, but not all the neighbors are one story, a little more one-sided than represented by the uh, numbers in the staff report, limited number of parcels. On the other hand, I went in the gate far enough to look down the length of the lot towards the back, and my impression is that two stories back there is probably not an imposition, and we haven't heard from anybody, so. Um, and I also had some email with uh, 
Adrian Fernandez regarding the difference between guest house and accessory structures, and we we'll, may want to just go into detail on that later. John? And I accompanied Craig on that visit. Uh, Did was, you? Didn't no, I? you? No, you didn't. Oh, we drove, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I drove by. Um, okay, a couple questions. Um, quick question, yeah. Um, you mentioned landscape lighting. Uh, and our, our, our dark skies ordinance basically restricts landscape lighting. Uh, is it covered? Is it compliant? The landscape lighting plan compliant with the dark skies? John, ordinance? we've gone over this multiple times that any project coming before us has to be compliant with dark skies. And if we had a compliance department that, that did that, I would not ask the question. So, um, Rather than put it in and have to have it complied with, I just want to find out if if what is being approved has been run by the Dark Sky Ordinance. That would be a question That's for a question the for Rick. Yes, that, that is correct. Um, the lighting is all uh, supposed to be uh, under 850 lumens. Um, the biologist has reviewed the... Uh, the landscape lighting as well. The uh, all the lighting is uh, basically downward facing. Doesn't have the ability to face upward. It's fully shielded. Um, landscape lighting is primarily going to be path lighting, um, which again is also uh, compliant with the dark skies ordinance in that it's it's fully shielded um, and meets the uh, the criteria. Um, in terms of the color temperature, lumen output, um, essentially everything listed within the, the dark sky ordinance. Great. And just, also just, just, there's just, a condition of approval requiring compliance, which will run with the development. And just, as, uh, as a point of clarification, you can do path lighting, but you cannot do landscape lighting. Path lighting is landscape lighting. Terminology-wise, no, it's, it's, it's transit lighting. You, you can't light plants, et cetera. Um, you can second use the question, path light to light a plant. It just lights it downwards. You can also use the directional light and attach it. Yeah, you got to read it again. Right you got to read the ordinance All right. again. All right. uh, the second question is: second question. Is there any new fencing on this property? Rick, From what there, there, there will be um, a new uh, uh, entry gate um, for all of the entryways there. Uh, including obviously a, a vehicular uh, access gate, uh, but there's no new fencing on the uh, on the four to one slope uh, or the more than four to one slope prop down to the river or the uh, gully. That, yes, that, that that is my understanding that there's no additional fencing being proposed down there. Um, I'm just pulling up the site plan right now just to confirm this. I didn't see any, but I want to make sure. Correct, yes, okay. I, I have not come across that in any of the uh, Okay, and uh, the very last question. So I'm gonna ask every planner now, it's, did you visit the property? I did, yes. Okay, I, uh, great, that's all I need to know, thank you. Okay, we've got the applicant here, um, uh, Greg Warner, and I, I think Kevin Poffenbarger is part of the team, is that correct? Yeah, okay. That's correct. And um, do we have any, uh, Online speakers, I don't have any other speaker slips for in person. Yeah, there's no raised hands. Okay, so you guys, you, if you'd like, you've got 15 minutes if you want to come up and uh, represent. Um, and we can ask, or we could ask you questions, whatever you'd like to do. Greg Warner, uh, Walker Warner Architects, uh, thanks for having us. Welcome. Here to answer any questions. Appreciate your thoughts and comments. All right, thank I'll you. Just sit here in case. You've got 14 minutes and 52 seconds <laughs> left. <laughs> now, we'll, well, however much time we need to ask you is what you've got. So we're going to close the public hearing. There are no online speakers. Uh, we'll bring it back up here to the table. Can I just start with a, a quick question? For some reason, in my notes, and we had seen this before, and this is a note from the last time. I thought they were under the max TDSF by three square feet. Was Has there been a revision that brought them down 
whatever it is, more like 80 or something now. So is, is this just an old note that I have, or why did I think it was? Uh, maybe this is a question for Rick. So, yeah, I, I believe that the TDSF hasn't changed. Hasn't from, changed. No, yeah. It, potentially, you might be uh, thinking of the grading, perhaps, or... Yeah, I don't know. This was this. I think this was a note left over from when we were looking. So I, I can't be definite about. That. Okay. So, comments, questions, guys. Any anything? There's no questions. I move approval of item four A. Well, I, Sec I, I, I do have comment. Sorry. But Second with discussion. Being, second with discussion. Okay. Um, anybody besides me? For, a question? For any comments or, op or questions, whatever. Let's hear what John's got. No, I made the motion. Oh. I thought you said, did you have any comments? Or Craig, Craig, I, I Craig sorry, sorry. The chair does. Okay, all right. All right, so for the record here, um, to be clear, precedent matters when the code is insufficiently specific, where there's gray area to be interpreted. And in, that, in those cases, I'm all for finding favorable interpretations where it can be accommodated in the gray area. Where the code is specific, and past decisions have gone against it, those decisions can't be considered precedential, but I think have to be just considered incorrect. Multiple wrongs don't make a right. In this case, it's not gonna be dispositive, but I need to call it out to be consistent. We have the uh, 62 square foot machine room has not been counted as TDSF. I'm gonna call this out every time it comes up because- Mechanical the, room? The, the TDSF square footage does not reference the six foot limit that does apply to habitable space. The LCP 2.1, general definitions, total development square footage, it's the calculation of the interior space of the primary and accessory structures, basically period. Regardless of what the use is. Yeah, yeah. and, and it, it, it's development. It's not just, you know, it, it's got a floor, it's got stuff in there, I think it, by the code, that needs to be counted. In this case, it's not gonna be dispositive because it doesn't push them over the limit or anything, so, um, but I, I think that needs to be called out that that, that could hang somebody up in future. Um, now, I think on the site plan review analysis, this doesn't fully consider the neighborhood character, and I, I think this represents TDSF creep. The question in my mind is how significant or is it significant? And I think I'm getting from the other four of you that you don't think it's that, that much of a big deal. Uh, so I won't go into the math, but it does, just to summarize that, um, that the proposed 6,785 is 2.28 times the average TDSF of the neighborhood, 1,500 plus larger than the biggest, which is at 5,255. So it's, it's a bump up. But again, it is tucked down in there, and, and I don't think it's an imposition on anybody, but I think that's just worth pointing out that in, in another circumstance that that could be problematic. Finally, three residences. Um, and I don't know that just putting in a deed restriction, restriction may not be enough. We've got a 414 square foot attached guest house and a 485 square foot pool cabana. Uh, we know the code limits the number of, of these habitable second units to no more than one of either. And in this case, the cabana looks like a guest house to me. It, it, the definition, the dictionary definition of includes cabin, cottage, or hut, all of which imply hab habitability. This one has a full bathroom, including a bath. Um, I, and I spoke to Adrian, or we had an email with Adrian about this. And he said, the guest house has a closet while the cabana does not. And I think he's referring to, there's a planning interpretation manual that says it's, we don't consider it an excess, uh, a habitable structure if it doesn't have a closet. But this does have upper and lower cabinets built in along half a wall. So it seems to me a fine line between, you know, whether you fold your clothes or hang them. And uh, so, plus if you could just stick an armoire in there or have a finished carpenter change that cabinet into a closet in a day or two, this is a fully habitable second unit. So I find that problematical here. Um, and then finally, this is just a question for staff, but it's, it's something I'm curious about. The, uh, 
it seems like there may be an inconsistency about breezeways. Um, Adrian had said to me that that it's a it's a guest house if it has an, as opposed to just being a bedroom, like the guest house in this case, because it has separate exterior access. But I think frequently we see bedrooms that have exterior access, right? Sliding glass doors onto decks and so forth. Um, and, and they're not considered guest houses. So I don't know why this one was, and maybe it doesn't need to be. And then another sort of definitional question, I guess that was sort of rhetorical, but um, the breezeway, we have three bedrooms that just open onto the breezeway, and we're saying those are not opening into an exterior space. So we wouldn't call those guest houses, but it, the breezeway is, an, is, is a breezeway indoors or outdoors? It's a screened, I think this is maybe for Richard, that, that maybe you, like, it, it, we're calling it TDSF because it's, it's wide enough, but how do you call a breezeway interior such that this isn't four guest houses? The fact that there is a screen there uh, to me is the reason your typical breezeway is a unenclosed area between two buildings with just a it's a covering over it so that you could walk from one to the other without getting rained on mm -hmm. and in the case of this particular design we have seen similar designs like this and the fact that there is that there is some sort of barrier there functioning as a wall to create basically a hallway so we're just the, the screen, even though it's wind and p potentially rain permeable, that, that we're still calling it indoors. Typically when we see those, it they may call it screened. Um, I'm not familiar with exactly what we have here. The architect could explain that. Uh, we have seen them where it's there's an ability to wall it off from the elements if you have a windy storm, uh, for lack of a better term. Mm. Okay. All right. I'm just, it's just kind of a nomenclature thing, but figured it might make a difference at some point. All right. So those are my uh, questions and comments. Oh, one final. We read that the pool has footings that go deeper than for the rest of the building. We're also in prime Chumash habitation territory, a, a prehistoric Chumash habitation. Um, in, in these conditions, we often require a professional monitor to be on site during all excavation. Would, would there be appetite for that on this site? I mean, there is an existing house, but they're going to be going a lot deeper uh, into where those kinds of prehistoric remains might be. Um, I'm not a, pro a uh, expert on the Shumash, but I will say that it doesn't strike me as the area of Point Doom that I'm aware of where a lot more things have been found, but I... So I'm, I'm hearing there's probably not a majority uh, I'll accept there. Uh, amendment if, if you can get the other party to accept an amendment. I mean, I, I think it is, it, but the, I also don't want to argue about, about that it. Is that the pool was permitted on something separate. Yeah. So that's not really even part of this. So that's what the reluctance is to deal with that. And basically the Majority of the house is going where an existing house was and where it was obviously graded before when the previous house was done. So, you're th any impact so I'm looking at that that it's disturbed. And if they didn't make the, in, the implication when the pool was approved, we don't really have the authority to do that. Right. All right. For the record, I, I think this is a borderline situation, and I see we don't have the, the vote for the amendment, so that's fine. I have a landscape question um, for Mr. Warner. Is that it? Um, so uh, there's a large hedge in front of the, the property from the plan that I'm looking at is that it looks like that's being removed because yes. I only see two trees that are to remain on your landscape plan. The hedge isn't removed. The hedge is staying. Correct. Okay. There's a jacaranda and there's a couple other trees. I see a jacaranda and one other tree that's to remain. Correct. There's a pine. And you've had that approved with the biologist that that hedge is Every, everything. To okay. do with the all right, just clarifying. Yep. Was was the hedge ever permitted? I don't know. It's been there for a long, long time. Um, 
as well as the two property line hedges along each side of the property. We're not, we weren't planning to affect those. So what's difficult for me in that is that there's other properties in the same area where you guys, we've you gone and implemented them to remove them. And I just want to make it very clear that we're not implementing them to remove them and that we be consistent with that. That's all I'm saying. You're saying we're not, you're, you're leaving the hedge because it's consistent to let people violate I'm leaving it. the hedge because they're not, you know, they're not disturbing it. And I don't, I don't necessarily have an issue with it because I think a lot of the other neighbors have it, have it, but. So John, you'd have the argument too as to why that it should be cut down to. I'm just well, saying. Well, I know it, it's, it's very simple. If they build it without a permit prior, after 1993, it's not allowed. Uh, I don't know when they built it, so I can't see, see anything. Perfect. Great. Yeah. All right. But the new one's going in. They're not exempt. Understood. Okay. Um, I, I just have to say, in principle, on the TDSF count, I have to vote no on this. But can we have a roll call, please? Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? Yes. Commissioner Peek? Yep. Chair Hill? No. Motion carries. And the motion carries. Uh, and we're now. Where, Thank you where very much. You? you guys ready for a break? You want to try one more? What's up next? 5A is. Okay. Well, 5A is probably going to get continued. Well, let's do we'll let's see. do a break. Okay, All right, so we're going to take a break. It's 8:11. How about it? Uh, 8:20. Is that too long? Yeah, and nobody. Yeah, please don't speak to any of the commissioners about any items. Do not approach us. Just consider us radioactive.
All right, folks, the lights are flashing. Intermission is coming to an end. All right, we have in front of us here item 5A. Um, Tyler, you're going to be handling this? Yeah, I'm uh, going to consider hearing it. Well, because I think there's some real legal questions we had to discuss. And I'm going to make a motion okay, to so start with to continue this item. So your motion is to continue before we hear a staff report. Right. Do we have a second for the motion? And I, I want to explain why. I, I think there's, in reading the correspondence today, I don't know how many people read it, there's items in there that appear to me, and this is just an appearance on the single reading, that we have a situation where two applicants were treated with different definitions and different uh, manners, and that the staff needs to work that out uh, because we're in legal jeopardy because of it. Let me ask a question, uh, Patrick. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is there any legal jeopardy with that? And the second part of this will maybe be for Rebecca, is when would this come back? If it's continued. When's the calendar available? I think that the most likely date would be April 15th if it were to be continued to a date certain. Um, it, but I would like to defer that to Senior Planner Eaton to make sure that he's comfortable with the dates for that. Yeah, I think if it's continued until it was the 15th was would give us comfortable. All right, Patrick. <clears throat> no, should the commission tonight feel comfortable proceeding? Um, the allegations in that late breaking correspondence um, are such that I feel comfortable that you guys can proceed. Now, I, I just want to point out that there weren't, these weren't necessarily allegations. These were uh, writings by staff that came to different conclusions than the staff report for this project. And, and so as the ultimate, the ultimate decision makers, it is incumbent on the planning commission to make that decision. Staff can draft its staff reports and can make its recommendations. The, the planning commission is the ultimate, uh, not the ultimate, but in this tonight, the ultimate city decision making body. My, my, not take, staff. On it, my take on it is that it, it needs to be continued for certain reasons here. Uh, but my wonder is whether the, I think there's probably some value in opening it now and getting at any issues or concerns or clarifying things. I, I don't expect we'll get over the humps, and we will need to continue. But I, but I'm not sure how to articulate that exactly. Yeah, like, my, so, oh, go ahead. My, so here's my next part of that. Yeah. Knowing that there's a little bit of a potentially open-ended situation yeah. here, where we could be talking about this for a really long time, I would s suggest that we move this item to our last item. Right. If we get through the other items. And we have time for to, to start that grade. If not, it's going to get continued anyways. And I don't think we have a reason to continue the other items that are before us tonight. Okay, I will make a, I will change my motion in moving this item. Okay, the last that time. sounds good. Okay, that makes sense. Well, uh, so we we have you have a motion. Yeah. So, so the, the motion is to put item five A after item five C, and see how we go. Yeah. Correct. And then, um, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll second. Well, you, I guess we have That's a, my motion. John and. <laughs> we have both two guys making the motion, well, seconding made, each each other. Not really. I made the motion. Do you not? No, that's fine. Do whatever okay. you want to do. Skyler seconds John's motion. All right. Roll call, please. Can can I confirm? At, at one point, um, I believe Vice Chair Mazza made a motion to continue the item to a date uncertain. Did you? I, I pulled that, that and and made this motion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? No. Commissioner Smith? No. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So, so for now, then, that means we are on to, uh, for the moment now, let's see. Sorry, Tyler. Five. Five B. Five B. And this will be. Planner Brooks, um, would you like me to read the title? I'll read the title. Coastal Development, this is at 
29198 Larkspur Lane, Coastal Development Permit Number 21-014 and Demolition Permit Number 23-005, an application for the construction of a new one-story single-family residence and associated development. Take it away, Planner Brooks. Good evening, Chair Hill and members of the Planning Commission. Um, this is CDP um, 21-0014. The project is um, a little over an acre in size, uh, located at the end of a cul-de-sac in the Point Doom residential neighborhood. The site is surrounded by residential developments, um, and immediately to the south of the project site um, is a development that's currently under construction. The site does include a water tank, landscaping, and a storage container, which are proposed for removal with this application. Here is a site plan depicting the proposed development. Um, adjacent to the cul-de-sac is a detached barn. Um, the residence, oh, the project includes a, a residence with an attached garage and an attached second unit. Um, there's also a pool on the northern side of the property. Um, the project is consistent with all applicable development standards, um, including um, construction on slopes less than four to one in the Point Duke neighborhood. The project does not include any discretionary requests. And the next couple of slides are a couple of photos of the store pole installation. This is taken from within the front yard. And this is another photo taken from within the property. After the staff report was published, staff noticed a couple of um, modify, modifications needed to the project conditions. Um, the first of which is condition number 58. There's a typo. So here is the language that includes the strikeout for that condition. And then um, staff added another condition, number 70, your new condition number 77, which requires the recordation of a deed restriction for the second unit. And this is the language that has been um, updated in the draft resolution. In conclusion, staff recommends adoption of resolution 24-19 as amended, approving the subject CDP application. I am available for any questions. All right, thank you, Renika. Uh, disclosures, Dennis? None. Skyler? Uh, none other than I spoke with the applicant. He contacted me about his frustration with the planning process um, a long time ago and advised him to see it through and that the city was doing whatever they could and to talk to his planner. And I would say that uh, I find John and Linda to be very good, honest people. That's it. Commissioner Leonard? Um, I've driven by the site. Um, the Hanleys used to be my next door neighbor for a few years, and that's about it. Um, Skyler, so you're, you're saying you're friends with them? Is that the I'm friends with them, but it, it, I was yeah. more making the comment that I've found them to be very good, honest people. And okay. it's not like, uh, unfortunately, he's not coming over for cocktails after the meeting tonight. All right. Uh, <laughs> I visited the site on Friday with John. The gate was locked, but the neighboring site let us come in and look down from the side so we got a good view of the whole parcel. Um, it appears that the stream was topographically, there's a stream there that's been filled in with dirt. Uh, it, such that the area that's now relatively level was very likely steeper than four to one. That's confirmed by PVC drain pipes routing drainage past the filled area. And this afternoon, I just noticed that in actual fact, this lot is one of the rare lots on po Point Dune that has a blue line stream on it. If you look on the official city map, there's a blue line stream. so. Uh, that's my disclosure, John. Uh, exactly the same. Okay, so we have, do we have an applicant here? Okay, I don't, I don't have any cards filled out, or do I? Did any, do, do we have any speaker cards? If you could, uh, if you'd like to speak, you would be welcome to do so and fill out a speaker card afterward. Are you, is your intent to simply respond to any questions this evening? Yeah, you can respond to any questions. Okay. Uh, and then, so we don't have any other uh, in-person speakers. Is there anybody online? No, there's no raised hands. Okay, with that then we'll close the public portion of the hearing, bring it back up to the table. If we have questions, we can ask you. You might want to come down close. I, well, maybe we, we might not have questions, so we'll wait and see.
Um, any, any comments from folks? John. Um, I'll leave it up to you to do the blue line stream, but um, this property has been recently fenced. Uh, we did the property next door. The fence crosses the blue line stream and encloses more than a quarter of an acre. Uh, and so is there, was there a permit issued for that fence? And, um, or is it included in this application? I'm not aware of uh, perimeter fencing as part of this application. Um, maybe the property owner can speak to if a permit was pulled. I'm not familiar. Can with, I ask uh, you if you got a permit? Uh, can you come up front and tell us if you got a permit for that fence and from who? So some years back when my wife and I bought the property, there were portions of the property that were fenced, and we simply continued it around the perimeter. Are you aware you need a permit to do that? No. Okay, thank you. Other comments? I, I, I don't know how to, how to deal with this, that we have a blue line stream. There are no findings that I saw about uh, how to do that. The, the stream, I don't know if you have the LCP maps handy if, if anybody needs to see that, but it's pretty conclusively runs halfway across the Do you, parcel. Can you ask one of them to pull that up so that we can look at that and the, see that? And the, the drawn line corresponds with the portion of, of, the, uh, of the stream, the existing stream that has not been filled in yet. Um, or I don't want to say yet, but the more northerly side was filled at some point just looking at the, the natural topography, there's sort of an artificial flat spot where the stream would be. And then the way the, the LCP map was drawn, the blue line starts immediately where the more natural stream starts on the property. So the significance of this is that nominally, by code, you need to be set back 100 feet from the blue line. And uh, we don't have any findings on what the setback is here, and I don't know. It looks to me like we're probably within the 100 feet, so it would, we'd need some kind of um, variance on that. Yeah, you'd also, I just want to mention that the uh, fence involved in that, that's a wildlife corridor uh, that goes down to Westwood Beach, uh, and that would be shutting off the wildlife corridor. And that, does the, does, um, Richard, does the, the quarter acre fence rule apply here? Or is that only in, in uh, an ash? Well, no, it's anywhere. 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 So the fencing requirement applies citywide. Yeah. About the amount of area you can fence in. On the concern about the stream, this isn't Point Doom, so the issue is four to one slopes. And we've had this discussion uh, before. And I've had it with the Coastal Commission, who's confirmed that the concern is four to one slopes. Uh, so that is the reason why when staff did the uh, analysis on this particular project, the development was limited to the portions of the property that based on the slope analysis were flatter than four to one. And at the way the project is proposed, and Renika can confirm for me, but I don't believe any development is in the area of the blue line stream as shown by the ESHA map. Well, my, my understanding is that in general point doom is we go by the four to one slope, but that there were the one or two places where it is a identified blue line stream that would be still applicable. And in fact, did, well, did we not- the setback is applicable. Did we not um, handle it that way on a, we had an application further down Wandermere a year or two ago that I thought we had to we had the findings to show that, yes, it's far enough away from the stream. And I'd like to, the Fish and Game has not written a letter on this property. Is that correct? To allow development on a blue line stream? No correspondence from Department of Fish and Game. Now, when we looked at the property, it's, it seems very apparent that it's that it's been filled in because the directly down river, like very limited number of feet, it's a very steep gully. 
Um, so did anybody do any uh, checking on whether or not that's original grade? I'm not aware of any unpermitted grading. If that was your question, yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of any Did unpermitted look grading. For it? It looks I know like there was an issue on the property adjacent to this site, which is immediately south. Um, there was an issue with that property owner. I believe they um, filled in the gully with a bunch of like construction material, but that wasn't on this site. That was on the adjacent site. But did anybody check to see if it was? On this project site, no. Okay. It looks to me like that whatever was filled has been there a while. Would it, uh, would it make a difference if this was done before or after cityhood or before or after the Coastal Act? In other words, would it be if it had been done without a permit way back when, is that uh, allowed as a sort of existing non-compliant? Blue Line Stream is federal. Yeah, it would probably depend on the rules at the time in that we would not, you know, sanction something that was illegal. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in what you could or could not do under the you know, Clean Water Act or, or, or whatever applicable law was there. I would contemplate that it, it is that they re would re require something, but that's just a, a guess for me. Well, so the blue line designation uh, came into effect in Malibu with the LCP in 2002, correct? So anything, I mean, presumably the concept of blue line existed previously. It's, it's my but understanding, not and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, that the blue line streams were taken from the federal, federal maps. That they, they designated streams as blue line. That's why they're covered by the fish and game. At, at what? Well, it's a state. It's a state fish and wildlife that, well, it's I, also that it's I think it's also federal. Too. Like Clean Water Act, maybe. But um, well, I don't think the Coastal when, Commission invented blue line streams. When would that have been done? Oh, before the Coastal Commission. Um, I have a question for the applicant. Um, so you were not aware of the fence. You continued the fence. You're now aware of that. Is that something that you're willing to remove in the area that's down by the stream? Absolutely. Okay. Um, that and would be a condition of approval right. that that fence is is removed. Basically, you're not allowed to fence in the area where the the that's down by the stream. Essentially, that's it. I'm not going to dictate it. Well, exactly well that's a quarter acre. Let planning do that. But Sorry. and also you. Could you tell me to come to the mic? C come oh, to yeah. the mic. John, come up please. to the mic yeah. for a second. Sorry. Just for the, yeah. so the public can hear. Yeah, absolutely could take down the fence right. where you wanted it taken down. Okay. And you can you can fence a quarter of an acre. And I don't know how that's on this particular site, how that would interact with the stream necessarily, but you could probably get it the full quarter of an acre without being too close to the stream, probably. Oh, easily. Okay. The idea was just to keep the dogs within the, yeah. within the property. And there's coyotes that come, and so it's little dangers uh, that's all but yeah. if the fence needed to come down as it crosses the stream we'd be happy to do it possibly you know just like i said it's coyote issue okay mm -hmm. um by the way they can jump over a fence <laughs> yeah they can <laughs> yeah 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 they can uh i'm a little <laughs> I'm a little unclear on what's being brought up in regards to the Blue Line Stream thing, because I think we've been going on Point Doom with the four to one, and that's sort of what well, I've been directed to do. So if there's something that's different with that, then we need to make well, sure that that's clear. Well, the interpretation lately seems to have changed, in my opinion, okay? Because when I went to the hearing in 2002, they said, okay, four to one, we'll give you that, but you still have to follow the riparian habitat setback, okay? And when you go right over the stream of the fence or you come right up to it, there is some riparian, in most cases, on a blue line stream. You can't just fence across it. Like the one up on Cuthbert, they couldn't bulldoze across it. Um, those still, and in, in, I don't think staff's interpreted that, that you can waive that. Um, Bernica, while we're discussing and trying to sort this out, could you get, give us a ballpark of what is the distance from the structure to the blue line? I, I saw this sort of too late this afternoon, but you know, this might make a difference if it's 
30 feet versus maybe it's over 100 feet. Yeah, I'm looking to pull up GIS now to scale it out. But, I mean, it would be helpful to know if we're talking about something substantive or not. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you, John. What no, no, you? that I was just trying to, Skylar was asking a question. Um, while she's doing that, also, you've got a lot of ficus planted along that back fence that if you're going to be tightening the fence in any way, that shouldn't be back there, also in the stream area. Um, I don't know, did you guys notice that? The, the sort of eastern side of the fence area has, what, like 50 ficus trees planted back there now? Something like that. Yeah, along the eastern boundary, that wouldn't be in crossing the stream. That's perpendicular to that line. Is there that, way there's not going to be a fence there anyway, so. If there's not a fence, it's okay to just leave the ficus. If you want to look yeah. at ficus to do nothing, sure. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Yeah. It's your back boundary line, so you know that you can't. They can't be over six feet. Yeah. Um, and in reference to the to the blue line, Renika, we had gone through the um, setback specific to the OWGS system in our analysis of where it needed to be placed in a certain distance from the stream. Well, it hmm. appears so to be that right was next to it, and maybe I'm reading it wrong. Yeah, the cliff where does this lock spring? So now I'm, I'm forgetting where the uh, the OWTS system is. Is it? At, it's out near the street. Yeah, I'm just trying to find it's the, on the, the north the property map. line. The furthest away from the stream bed. So, uh, west of the pool. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, on its face, that would look to be um, reasonably far from the stream. Whether that's it's as far as it could be away. Yeah, I mean, again, this this seems like it comes down to for me, it comes down to a question of precedent and interpretation. And is you know, is this a black letter thing or is this a interpretation wiggle room thing? What I think, I think the the. Owner just told you that he's going to take the fence down, and I'm not sure what else you want him to do. No, it's a question of how close the structure is to the stream. I don't. It doesn't look like it's very close. Well, it'd be nice to get a number. Well, you're worried about the structure, but the septic tank, which is probably the high dollar one, and you got to spend a lot of money on that. So, I'm not sure what you're after here, Chair. Uh, I'm after consistency in how we apply the law, and if we tell somebody they can't build uh, less than 100 feet from a blue line stream, then we have to tell everybody that, unless they can, you know, come to us with a variance. Maybe that, that would be the solution here, we can process a variance. Maybe they don't need it. Maybe they are far enough from it. Well, I, I'm, I could agree that this is the headwaters of the blue line stream because above it is drain pipes where they drain the gully into the down the stream it's somewhere along the line that stream got filled in but the blue line stream ends in the middle of this property okay so there's not a whole lot of riparian habitat at the headwaters it's only four or five feet wide so I don't I don't think there's much riparian you have to sit back from the riparian habitat not from the stream itself. Well, you have, you're supposed to anywhere else in Malibu, but here. Um, uh, I, I, uh, what is the, a blue line is a blue line. A blue line, yeah, and then they, that's you go. That's not to, the way that that's supposed to be applied on Point Doom. On Point Doom, it's supposed to be a four and one slope. And that was very, very, that's been the precedent for the no, city. No, I, I agree with since you. Since it was changed. Well, what they said is, you, but you must honor the stream setbacks from riparian habitat but for the couple of blue line streams everywhere else it's the four to one rule and no it's four to one no, it's, it's just, four to one regardless there is a stream there it's a blue to line stream it's a federal stream so you have to have the riparian setback there just isn't any riparian at the very end of it all right because it's been drain pipe if i may chair please i hope this sheds some light but this is not a new question i've dealt with this question for coming up on 20 years at one point, as I mentioned to this commission in a previous hearing, 
a city biologist applied a riparian setback. The Planning Commission said that the guy was about as truthful as a used car salesman, and that was the end of it. I've also followed up with the Coastal Commission on this matter, and the Coastal Commission has confirmed that it is not a riparian setback that gets applied in this area. It's development four to one slopes of the criteria. And if you take a look at the LIP, it, it has a riparian setback, and then it goes on to, but in the Point Doom area, development shall avoid a four to one slope. With no exceptions. That's correct. You are not okay. to be, it, it, well, I'm back up. If it's a four to one slope between the front, the front door and your driveway in front of your house, that's a bit different. But the idea when, the, when this was approved was that four to one slopes essentially would afford that protection to these riparian habitats because it would be that slope that would lead to that drainage. Uh, so the best I can say here for the council is that to my knowledge, and like I, as I mentioned, conversations with Coastal, it's we're to be focused on four to one. Renee, on do you development, have a, is John? this correct? Though it's to all development, all right, I'm make four to one is banned. So the 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 reference to the LIP for which Director Malka is saying it's short, so I'll read it. However, in point in the Point and Doom area, new development shall be designed to avoid encroachment on slopes of 25 percent grade. Or steeper, right? Which means four to one, no development. It, it doesn't it, exist. Now. It doesn't say how to handle the, the blue line, though. But no, 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 on, it doesn't on. say that. I just want to point out that a fence is development. You need oh. a permit for it. Okay. okay. We we've um, we got okay, we got that, got that much. Yeah, that's we a got big that question much. on Point Doom because it's all being. Can I make a motion? Uh, yeah, I just would well, just want to let me just want to say, on. say say one more thing, <laughs> and that is, nothing in there gets rid of the the fish and game requirements, okay? And then, so... Uh, All right, hang, so, on, hang uh, on. Let's hear from Renika. This may be helpful. Well, first, I apologize. It took a minute. Um, we do not have GIS on this computer, but I uh, will say that this project is considered appealable development because it is within the 100-foot buffer from the mapped stream. Uh-huh. We, but we just don't know how, how much with that. No, I can't measure it unless I can go to my computer at my I, I desk think and measure saw it, but. it. I think it's far enough. I mean, we don't want to continue this hearing to go out and measure it. Yeah. All so, right. so Skylar, if your motion is to accept the Do item. Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear the motion? Yeah, I'd like to hear it. Okay. <laughs> the motion is going to be to approve the item as staff recommends and have planning go out and make sure that the fence and development in the reference stream area from tonight's hearing is removed. Second. And does that mean, does that motion mean that they have to follow the, the fencing rules, the, the quarter acre? Anybody. that's the code. Anybody has to follow those rules, Okay, John. that's part of that motion. All right, and I'm just going to say. I will second it if he is. If, all right, and I'm just going to say, having just heard that we are within the 100 feet to have made that appealable, I will have to vote no on this because I think this would require a variance if we wanted to go there. And so, Chair Hill, if I may, um, uh, Planner Brooks, can you bring up that slide with the, the change conditions? I want to make sure, one, your your motion was, you know, uh, included those requests. It did include those. Staff. It did? Yes. Correct. And I, I want to make sure that, because you said you were going to add condition number 77? That is correct. That's the, the restriction for the second unit. Am I? Okay, and maybe okay. I'm, I apologize, maybe I'm looking at the wrong, the existing resolution I thought for 5B has a 77 already, maybe I'm. This will be a new 77 and then the rest and of the conditions, yeah. Got it, perfect. Sorry about that, Chair, thank you. Okay, so I think we're ready for a roll call, yeah? Roll call, please. Commissioner P? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? Yes. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Chair Hill? Uh, regrettably, no. Motion carries. All right, thank you. You got your got your lot. You're Thanks, gonna move your fence and you're gonna be good. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we're now on to 5C, 29335 Heather Cliff. Um, where is this? Here it is. This is a 
CDP number 16-003, site plan review number 16-003, and demolition permit number 24-014, an application for a remodel in addition of a second story to an existing single family residence, replace existing on-site wastewater treatment system, and construct a swimming pool, spa, and other associated development. Um, let's see. Uh, now, Tyler, you're up. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Hill, uh, members of the Planning Commission. The next item tonight, as mentioned, is a proposal uh, for a remodel of the existing residence, which includes an addition of a second story, a new pool spa, new on-site wastewater treatment system, and associated development. Uh, the pro uh, sorry, getting it up here. The project is located in the Point Doom neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, northeast of Heathercliff Road, although, I'm sorry, northwest uh, of Heathercliff Road. Uh, although PCH resides to uh, further northwest, the site is situated atop a steep ascending slope. Uh, it is not a visible from, it's not visible from any scenic area uh, indicated in the LCP. And the original uh, home was um, constructed in 1959. The project proposes the remodel of the existing residence, including 35% of uh, demolition of existing exterior walls. There is a 1,130 square foot second story addition, a new swimming pool, spa, uh, and associated pool equipment that will be screened. Uh, there's a replacement on-site wastewater treatment system to help with uh, the new additions. There's an outdoor barbecue and pool area and an associated decking. There's a permeable driveway and walkway proposed. Uh, and then two discretionary requests, a site plan review for construction up to 28 feet with a pitch roof and a, a demolition permit for the 35% exterior demolition as mentioned. Okay, that, is that it? No, I'm still oh. going, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, so here's the site plan. The second story addition is proposed on the uh, southwestern side of the property, the pool, spa, decks, and onsite wastewater treatment system is on the, on the northern portion of the lot. The proposed work is sited on slopes uh, that are flatter than four to one, which is consistent with the extra requirements of the chapter. Um, here's the southwest elevation. Uh, the project proposes a site plan review, as mentioned, for development up to 28 feet with a pitch roof. Uh, the red line here indicates um, the, the 28 foot line ab above the topography uh, descending uh, with the topography to show that it complies at, at all points. As mentioned, there's a proposal for 35% uh, uh, exterior demolition. Um, the project was, uh, the project structural plans were reviewed by the uh, City Building Safety Division who concluded that uh, the proposed remodel is feasible. And, and that they will not have to um, demolish more than 50% of the structure in order to achieve this um, remodel. So um, staff went and documented story polls in February of 2024. Uh, we, we did get a, uh, uh, an email uh, from a concerned neighbor um, about potential view impacts. Um, we went and assessed whether a primary view determination could be conducted on their site. The only area that the neighbor had impressive views were from their second story master bedroom, which is shown in the photo here. MMC section 1740.040817 states that a primary view determination can only be conducted from the ground floor and from a main viewing area, which does not include a bedroom. Main viewing areas on the ground floor were assessed and there was none uh, that had impressive views or uh, of any scenic areas. The ground floor views were all blocked by existing development and vegetation. Staff concluded that site visit without being able to conduct a PVD, but the neighbor was still concerned about their views. Um, the applicant has since submitted uh, correspondence of their own, uh, showing that, the other second that there are other second stories in the neighborhood, even on the ocean side of the street, and also that the proposed square footage is consistent uh, with the neighborhood character. So with that, uh, we recommend approval of the project uh, and we're available for any questions. Okay, thank you, Tyler. I, I understand that the applicant is here to answer questions and or respond to, right? Okay. Um, do, do we want to? 
We want to do some disclosures. Yes. Uh, Dennis? I met with four of those folks in the front row, um, and uh, that was it. We just discussed what was there, didn't learn anything different than what's in the staff report. Uh, same for me. I uh, have worked for the Ross over the years, have not worked for them though since 2022. Damn it. <laughs> Could have gone home early. Anyways, um, uh, but those are all just really small, just small repair things. So it doesn't change my opinion of tonight. And I uh, met with them all last week. I forget I think it was last week. And sure. didn't learn anything new. I was at the same meeting with Dennis uh, last week. Um, the Roths were a tenant of mine 15 years ago. And otherwise, um, that's it. Did you say 50 years ago? 15. Oh, phew. Um, I visited there on, with John on our trip on Friday, and I don't know that I learned anything that's not already in the staff report. John? Uh, exactly the same disclosure. Okay. All right, so you guys, you have 15 minutes if you want to make a presentation. You can reserve any amount of time for <laughs> rebuttal. Uh, I'll just let you know that right now we have um, a card from I think it's pretty sure it's the neighborhood that the, the neighbor who has a presentation to make I think probably a video I'm guessing I don't know um, and other than that there are no other cards are there any online speakers there are no raised hands no raised hands okay there, so that's that's there what, is a, a person that is online who previously this evening indicated her desire to possibly speak tonight if so uh, if she could click the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, so we might have somebody online, but, but go ahead. Okay. So, hi, we're the Roth family. I'm Heather. Clock. Uh, Jake. Um, first, I just wanted to. H hang on, hang on. Rebecca, clock, please. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you, Commissioner Chair Craig, Commissioner John, Commissioner Drew, Commissioner Schuyler, Commissioner Dennis, for your time, and especially to Tyler for all of his time and work on this project um, as I think you're always in a very long planning process more than eight years to be exact um, my husband fell in love with Malibu when he did a preparatory year before going to the United States Naval Academy and as soon as he was done serving we immediately tried to get here and move here um, we've lived in Malibu now for uh, over 20 years we lost our first home and everything we owned in the corral fire when I was seven months pregnant we were unsettled for years after until we finally were lucky enough to purchase this house. And after 10 years of living in it as it is and sharing a bathroom with my son, <laughs> uh, you can imagine our relation to finally be at this point in the process. Um, I just want to thank you all. We're going to save the rest of our time for our team's rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, just to be clear, we have your whole applicant team, their family, and uh, we have card here from Jamie Harnish. Uh, and then we have uh, David Gallacher. Is, am I pronouncing that right? Gallacher? Gallacher? Um, and you have a presentation. <clears throat> so you'll, you'll have three minutes. And uh, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Gallagher. Um, first off, apologies. The the did one of the digits in the uh, address there two nine three three five. I believe it is Heathercliff Road. So apologies for that. Um, the accent may not be, but we are certainly an American family. We live permanently full time in Malibu, uh, raising our family. Two nine three two eight Heathercliff Road is our family home. We closed on our property on January 31st this year and moved in on February 1st, just a little over six short weeks ago. The house is a culmination of our hard work over several decades and our endeavor to raise a family in the best possible environment. We were alarmed when the story polls for 29335 Heathercliff Road appeared within just a few days after moving into our home, almost directly opposite. We respectfully ask the question whether there was a genuine reason the story polls could not have been erected prior to January 31st. 
We understand the planning has been in process for a significant period, but we go from story polls to conclusion in less than two months. That is a very short period for due consideration and allowed us uh, no immediate signal that there was building work underway. May I add for the record at this time, neither myself nor Camilla had any prior knowledge of any building works being undertaken. It's Camilla on, online. Uh, we had been viewing the property only one month previously. We know that the property had previously sat vacant for several months. It is most unfortunate that our first interaction with our neighbors is uh, a dispute. We bear no ill will. We sympathize that the planning process can be difficult, expensive, and time consuming. We also recognize that much work has already been done. However, that should not sweep away our rights as property owners to preserve a treasured view of the coastline that has been approved and established for over 40 years. Neither Kimmler nor I have any experience, knowledge, or professional support regarding the planning process. We also recognize that much, if not all, of the coding, technical aspects of the plan have been assented to. In this respect, we cede to the committee arguments regarding code, technical, we're also aware that the adjacent property is well in excess of 4,000 square foot, therefore we do not wish to waste anyone's time arguing these points. Instead, appeal to the committee directly on the issues of integrity, privacy, and compromise. I refer you to the brief presentation provided and will let the pictures speak for themselves. Slides two through five clearly show that our entire coastal view and significant ocean view will be blocked by the proposed structure. That structure then will enjoy an enhanced version of the view that will be taken away from us. The second issue is privacy. In short, we are not currently overlooked by anyone. The addition will overlook every window at the front of our house. In conclusion, we do not wish to deny our neighbors expanding their property and wish to compromise, recognizing some degree of our views will be impacted. However, to completely block our treasured coastal view is unnecessary and against the spirit of what we are all here for this evening. We respectfully request alternatives be considered. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, would the applicant like to respond? You don't have to. Go ahead if you'd like. You've got almost 14 minutes remaining. Just to confirm, there's still no raised hands in Zoom. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'll just address a couple of those things. Um, first of all, as outlined in the commission agenda report prepared by Tyler, it was stated six times that they do not have a PVD. They don't have a point of view a determination from that second story. I don't know why that presentation actually says in it it's their first floor. I don't know, are they making things up now? I'm not really sure. Um, also, um, he mentioned something about uh, why, why didn't you know so much about the, why they didn't know about the polls in time. Yeah, the permit so was posted in the first week of December. Those permits, the sign was up there for two months before they bought the home. I don't know why they didn't know. I wish that they had spent more, as much due diligence with their property as they're clearly spending on this to waste all of our time. We wouldn't be here right now. I would just like to address the privacy issue. Um, none of those windows on the addition look that way. Or, or there are no windows that look that way. There's a small sliver window in the design that's actually in a closet. So the, the, the windows all look the opposite way. And you can see in there, um, it's actually three floors. So there's a, you've been out to the house and, and you've seen there's the entryway, a mid-level, and then this third floor. Um, you can see into that window from the street. So it, it's, it's not like our house invades their privacy on looking. First of all, we're not looking that way. And second of all, anybody can go in. Their shades are always drawn um, in those rooms anyway. Um, I will add that um, all of our neighbors are very supportive of the project. So yeah, each neighbor on either side. Every neighbor on the other and, side and across the street from us. And their next door neighbor who arguably, I guess, stands to lose that view as well. Um, so... We've got signed letters, we've got texts, emails of support. Um, I guess the last thing I would add is, you know, the house itself is odd for Malibu. It's, it's, a, it's a house that I would argue just by sitting here listening today wouldn't be allowed to be built. Um, the, the, the people that um, lived in the neighborhood, we have some 30 or plus residents on either side of us and across the street, watched it be built. 
and watch that third story addition be put on when the owners previously realized that they could see the ocean from the roof. So to us, we're just trying to change our lifestyle here, not take anybody's view. We just want to live comfortably in our home. Um, that will just be a three bedroom, the, three bath house. Yeah, and the argument too about <laughs> being able to move the structure, and Sam, if you want to chime in here, we're already under total square footage. We're already about a thousand square feet under the second floor of what we're allowed. We, we had a mindset of not designing a very big, obnoxious home. We just wanted what we needed to live. So the design itself cannot be just moved over. There's a staircase, there's engineering, there's a whole process that was involved over eight years to figure out the best place to put this very reasonably modest addition. Um, Tyler mentioned earlier that there's a, it's a sloping yard. It's not a yard that we can just extend out anywhere else. Um, it's also been mentioned in the report that it's a very environmentally friendly design. Um, to us, it's, it's a minimal project and it's really the only way that we can do it. And I just want to get on record, you know, one more time. The permit sign was posted when it should have been posted. It's been up right next to the mailbox. There's a picture, it's dated, it's been sent to the city, it's been noted by Tyler. The story polls went up as soon as we got approval to put them up. I, I don't really know what else to say about that. We, that day, we got them up as soon as we got the yes. So I guess that's all. And Do you have anything to add? I, 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 I just like want to say one it. thing too about the address, the, this is our first interaction. Actually, I had reached out, so it, it's not really our first. I, when I heard there was a complaint from this neighbor who never even came over or introduced herself or anything, um, but just went right to the city. I then wrote a very nice two-page letter just trying to explain exactly, basically all we just said, why this couldn't be moved, why how this had been in planning for eight years, why, um, and actually got a very terse, rude response back, so I'm not so sure about the no ill, Ill will. Um, but I'll let you, yeah, I'll let you go. Okay, just for the record, that was Larry and Heather Roth, the owners, and you, I don't have a card for you, I don't think. It should be there, Sam Widmer, the applicant. Oh, you're Sam, you're Sam right, okay, yes, Sam Widmer. Yes, I am. Got it. Good evening, commissioners and Chair Hill. My name is Sam Widmer. I'm the applicant for this project. Um, what I'm going to say may seem redundant just because of the commission agenda report and also the rules that we all know for PVDs. Um, so we all know that planning went out there to determine if the um, opposing neighbors had a uh, primary view determination and it was determined by the planning department that they do not they don't have a view from their first floor and they don't have a view from a primary room like a living room or a dining room so the planning department said no you don't have a view um, I would also like to point out that um, rather than this being uh, brought to you as a planning issue that maybe this would be better or more appropriate to be for the, sorry, the opposer to bring this to their sellers or buyer's agent as a civil matter for a lack of disclosure for the project that we have been pros proposing for years. Um, as Heather and Larry mentioned, we did properly post the notice of CDP uh, application outside of the house in the front yard on December 10th, 2023, 52 days prior to the close of escrow at 29328 Heathercliff Road, um, and they closed escrow on January 31st of 2024. The notice remained there for those 52 days and is still there now. Um, Again, we believe that the new owner should have done their due diligence, hired somebody, or the um, buyers or sellers agent should have been more honest about um, the proposed project. Everything is available via on base as public record. Um, other than that, I also just would like to drive home that we are in substantial conformance with the neighborhood. We're not asking to do anything that other people in the neighborhood haven't already asked to do or successfully done with permits. Um, and if you guys would like to say anything else or Jamie. Sorry, Larry, Larry again. I'd like to say one more thing. Um, the pictures themselves to me that were presented are a little bit misleading in the sense that 
you don't get an idea of this expanse of the view. Um, what we're doing is putting up a, a small structure that's necessary for us. Yes, it's in the way, but if you look just a little bit more to the left, which that picture conveniently cuts off, there's a lot of ocean. Their house is the highest one on the street by far. It's a big white house that looms over everything. You can see it from down the street, and there's still plenty of view. There's a little bit of also, I believe, some confusion on another picture there that was taken from the second floor that shows perhaps our structure there and how it might block the ocean. The second floor is almost as on par level with the street. If you walk down Heathercliff, you can't see the ocean from anywhere. If you stood on a six foot step ladder, you couldn't see it. There are homes all along the way. So I just, just wanted to add that, the pictures there themselves, and you've all seen the property, so maybe I'm beating a dead horse here a little bit, but. And they're really, their house is oriented more towards the back. They have a nice big flat lot. They're permitting for a pool. If you look at their house, we have some realtor pictures of, of um, from Redfin or wherever. Mm -hmm. Realtor.com, the MLS listing that shows, you know, the, clearly the kitchen on the first floor going to the back with a nice, big, beautiful, flat backyard where there's going to be a pool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those windows in the front are, clo or, are shaded most of the time. I have quite a few pictures during sunsets and things like that with the shades drawn. So I don't know. This is a bit curious for us. I would also like to mention that we did look into you know why not a flat roof why a pitched roof and you know what could we be doing or what have we done and why have we done it and when we looked at the neighborhood every single house on heathercliff road and wondermere in the surrounding 500 foot radius area has a pitched roof and we already also, have a pitched roof home right so we're not knocking down the house and building a new house we're adding on to it. So the existing roof will remain on the garage, the existing garage, and the rest of the first floor that is going to stay one floor. Um, so to do any kind of a different roof would be a little bit silly. And yeah. And we would also just like to mention that in the report that was just shown to you by the uh, opposing neighbor, they did mention several times that all of those pictures were taken from their first floor, but we do know because planning confirmed it, that they do not have a view from their first floor. And I think that concludes. Okay. Thank it. you so much. Thank and also thank you to Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. And thank you for all coming up to the site. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, still nobody in uh, online? No, there's still no raised hands. No raised hands? Okay. All right, uh, with, with, with that, we close the public first portion of the hearing. No. I'm sorry, you don't. We will address you if we, if we have any questions. Uh, no, I can't. We, we will get to the bottom of it. The, the process here works that the applicant gets time, opponents and anybody else gets a, a short time to present their view, and then the applicant gets the, the rebuttal time. That's how we always do it. Um, John, you have a Yeah, Tyler, question? could you what? put up the story poll pictures again? So I did, did I say we're closing the public portion of the hearing and bringing it back up to the table? Okay. Okay, uh, Larry or Heather, could I have you come up, or both of you? <coughs> when we visited, I pointed out that you have probably, I'm guessing, 10 to 12 foot ficus trees in front of your house. And then you were willing to to go to code compliance to remove those. Absolutely. Okay, great. That's all I need to know. Okay. Um, unless anybody else has a question, I'd like to approve this project with the addition of uh, compliance with the uh, code on the front um, uh, fence. Second. Like well, whatever it is out there. Landscaping. Yeah. Uh, do you have a second from Dennis. Second from Dennis. Okay, for discussion, Tyler. I actually had a question for the neighbor, um, Mr. Gallagher. If you could come up real quick to the Mr. Gallagher. Then hopefully I'm saying pronouncing that correctly. And my question for you is as to 
whether or not you were aware at the time you were purchasing this home that this was going on across the street? Absolutely not. Not at all? Myself, nor my wife. Okay, that's my question. Thank you very much. Um, roll call. Yeah, I, let me just say, uh, Mr. Gallagher, the, the, the rules on the primary view determination are quite black and white in this case, and it's unfortunate that you find yourself in this position, and I think they alluded to that, you know, uh, A, had you been around five or six years ago, maybe there would have been some give and take at that point and some accommodation could have sorted out, but they are so far down the track. And B, it does sound like there may be some s civil situation here, I either, uh, I, not for us to say, but whether disclosures weren't made or whether due diligence wasn't done, something, this is something that ideally you would have found out about. And so I, I think we're sorry, but I don't think we have any discretion to go beyond what the black letter of the code says. We, we, we're not allowed to deal with civil matters. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, I you know, so. I would just add that I find it appalling that you were in contract and purchased a house and then whoever was selling you the house did not disclose that there was an active permit getting applied for across the street. And that is a super unfortunate situation to be in. And, and I, pers on a personal level, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing who that is, but that's not a public matter, so. <laughs> yeah, you can get yourself into trouble there. Yeah. Can um, we call the question? Can we call the question? <clears throat> um, hey, I, I just want to be sure that we get we get that addition of the additional requirement of uh, Vice Mazza. You basically said the front yard. I, I want to make sure it's. Well, I just, it's it's code compliance on the on the, uh, the hedge and the, the whatever you call it. You good, Tyler? Yeah. Perfect. The hedge and what? Just the hedge. Well, whatever their code requires, you know, it's, I so, don't know if you say the hedge. I mean, that's not code. He's so basically the a code. condition that the front yard hedges must come into compliance with the required uh, standards. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Call a roll call, please, Rebecca. Vice Chair Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Uh, yes. Commissioner Leonard. Yes. Commissioner Peake? Yes. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. All right. With that, we are on to 5A, a quick break. While everybody gets organized, quick break. It's 917. How long do we need? 920. Oh, 920? Okay. All right. Let's just a very quick break. Smoke them if you got them. I don't want to get into the brown exit.
Okay. Here we go. We are now on to item 5A, Coastal Development Permit number 23-019 and Site Plan Review number 23-024, an application for a new single family residence, a second unit and associated development at 30053 Harvester Road. Uh, and we have, um, we had, uh, John has a question. Yeah, uh, uh, this is to our attorney. Um, I would like to, before I participate in this hearing, I'd like to have the um, Frank Angel attorney uh, explain whether or not what the Brown Act situation is here, because I do not want to violate the Brown Act and end up in a lawsuit. Correct. Is so, that possible? So, so Chair Hill, I can, I can speak to that. So the, the kind of two different government code provisions at play here, as I understand it, the Brown Act, which requires the and I'll, I'll read from it, a brief general description of each item of business to be transacted or discussed at the meeting. There is also some planning and zoning law that requires that we describe the date, time, and place of the hearing, the body for which it will be heard, i.e. the uh, planning commission, and then of course, similar language, the location of the property with the address, and then the description um, of, the, of the project. And taking a look at the notice of public hearing, Mr. Angel is correct. It does not explicitly state basement. However, it doesn't explicitly state tons of components. In reading at this, we don't talk about the number of bedrooms, the number of fixtures, the number of bathrooms. Thus, the notice of public hearing, I am confident we can proceed tonight if that is the will of the Planning Commission. Of course, if the Planning Commission, once again, in a policy-driven approach, not one that uh, is required by law, feels that the lack of inclusion of a specific uh, basement in the notice of public hearing somehow depresses public turnout or, or, or public comment. I will defer to the policy decision of the Planning Commission on, on that matter. From a purely legal standpoint, Chair Hill, you guys are good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments? All right. I have a well, further comment. Good to go. I okay. think that we are putting staff in jeopardy by hearing this tonight in that the material we got sent today shows on a quick reading without legal counsel shows that the two different, the, the applicant and the uh, apparent appellant got official in writing treatment by staff that is not consistent between the two parties. Okay, that, that it may very well be, and I, I probably agree with you. I think it's incumbent on us to either not hold the hearing at all or to open it, hear from the applicant, hear from the opponents, okay, so I'm gonna and, make, and, make, and make that determination I'm gonna make, based so on So I'm gonna determine that. I'm gonna make a motion that we continue this item to April 15th to save the city council <clears throat> a, a appeal hearing, save, and give staff time to determine what the situation is since they've only had several hours to do it. And I think we can say, oh, let's rush this through. I think what we're doing here is probably adding six months to it uh, if we hear it tonight. Uh, so personally, I, I personally, I yeah. I don't really think we're adding six months to it. The only thing that... I mean, from the, the cusp of it, it looks like it's a project that's going to get appealed anyways. But I do support staff, and if they want more time, I'm not opposed to that. I just thought that if we could get into some of the merits of this tonight and give some direction to staff, that that's not a bad thing. Yeah, we, we may or may not find ourselves hopelessly stuck, right? And, yeah. And, and did we hear already that the next potential date was April 15th? Correct. So we're not talking six months. No, no, John. I'm John's talking, referencing the fact I'm that if we do that, where it's going to get appealed council, right away. And notice, just, notice, notice. Yeah, he's Come right. Back he's he's back completely back accurate six about months. that. But you, you can't appeal a continued item. Chair, yeah. exactly. I think you should ask Mr. Kent and see what he thinks. I think. Well, well, before well, we do we that, have, now, we, we have a process here. The first, the, on the okay, table, we have a motion to that, continue. Do right. we have a second? Right. I mean, I don't. I just. You know, we have the. I think, it, I think on any one of these things, it behooves us to get the most amount of information and allow staff to be able to respond, res, 
respectfully and responsibly and with an adequate amount of time. And I mean, Frank made a very clear point that, yeah, you did get the information late. Why? Because we only got the report a week or half a week ago, and that takes time. I think he's completely valid in that. Um, and it's our job to read them. And even if we get them at the last minute, it's very difficult. Um, I just think that if we save going through the appeal process by letting it take a little longer, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I also feel that, like, we, I feel like I don't, I don't see the information that's brought forth what's different than what we already have. But I do know that he, his information does point out some different, you know, concerns related to the, the property. Are you seconding John's motion or not? I'm discussing it and pondering it because I have two <laughs> people next to me on each side, or one person on each side that really don't want to do that right and now. You don't want to get beaten up. I'm not going to get beaten up. I have very thick skin, you know. I've acquired yeah. that over the years. <laughs> but you know, I mean, we have, we have neighbors here to hear now. the item. Like, I, I just think we should hear from some people. <clears throat> That's it. That's my comment. All right. Well, so John, I don't think you're getting a second for your motion. I, I, I agree that I'm. At, so far, I don't see anything other than a continuance here, but I tend to agree with Skyler. Let's see if we what we can sort out, and we might be able to give better direction to staff about how to resolve the clearly outstanding issues, right? Whatever. Right. Okay. Clearly outstanding. Clearly outstanding to some, maybe not to others. Well, there's the, the, uh, there, the there's something there. So, all right, let's open the public hearing. We've got. Um, staff report. Staff report. Oh, I'm sorry. Disclosures. Um, staff report first, right? And then disclosures. Tyler, I think I read the description yeah. already. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Hill, again. Um, Tyler Eden, representing for uh, the project planner, Kanika Pompey. Um, so this project is for, as mentioned, a new single family residence, new second unit, uh, a couple of accessory structures. And associate development 30053 Harvester Road. Um, this project is located in the Malibu Park neighborhood. Uh, it's north of Harvester Road. It's a vacant, undeveloped parcel. The parcel is not visible from any scenic areas as indicated uh, by the LCP. The project proposes a 4,270 square foot two story single family residence uh, with a 970 square foot basement and a 750 square foot attached three car garage. There's a 900 square foot detached second unit, 500 square foot detached accessory garage, 432 square foot yoga studio, permeable driveway, swimming pool, new landscaping, an on-site wastewater treatment system, uh, and a site plan review for construction up to 24 feet in height to allow for a flat roof. The site plan here uh, shows the home uh, and um, uh, the home and the, the garage, I'm sorry, the home and the yoga studio are located, uh, sorry, let me go back. The home and the second unit are located towards the rear of the property, uh, and this elongated shapes of the structure coincides with the shape of the parcel. Uh, the home and yoga studio are proposed to the east, and the second unit and detached garage are proposed to the west of the property. Uh, the project is situated on slopes flatter than three to one, uh, which meets the requirements of the area as shown here on the slope analysis. The project is proposing a site plan review for development up to 24 feet. Uh, primary view determinations were assessed in the area and none are anticipated to be impacted. So uh, the neighbor to the west submitted correspondence regarding the potential for environmentally sensitive habitat area and protected trees on the property boundary between the subject site and theirs. A biological inventory was submitted for the subject site, um, and that concluded that ESHA does not exist within the area. Also, this area is not mapped ESHA per the LCP maps. Uh, the inventory identified a uh, native to uh, a toyon and a sycamore, uh, which are protected trees per LIP Chapter 5 if they meet the required size, uh, but, but the biologist did label these as immature. Um, the neighbor also listed the potential for a black walnut in the area. Uh, a native tree inventory was not required because the trees were situated on the neighboring property. Also, if the trees were of the correct size, 
that require protection from LIP Chapter 5. It does appear that the proposed development would be uh, would would meet the required setbacks of those trees. However, we would like additional time to confirm that information. Um, lastly, uh, this neighbor submitted supplemental correspondence today from an ecologist stating that the area might still be Esha. Due to the conflicting reports, uh, staff is requesting more time to uh, ensure that Esha does not exist within the area, and we would like our city biologist to go out and confirm the statements of the reports uh, with their own eyes. Uh, we did get, uh, here's, a, here's a picture uh, that kind of shows the nearest mapped streams that are roughly 900 feet away from the subject site. So no mapped Esha through the property. Uh, we did also get a concern from the neighbor uh, to the east of the subject site. Um, they first pot uh, cited potential view issues. Uh, we sent a planner out uh, to assess, uh, but a primary view determination was not conducted. Uh, the owner declined at the time. Um, from the planner's perspective, there didn't appear to be uh, areas that could be protected um, or that would benefit from the protections of a PVD. Um, uh, we, we did get additional correspondence from this neighbor today as well. Uh, they, they wish that a, a bigger setback would be required. Uh, the applicant is meeting the, the minimum setback on this side of the street, uh, but the, the neighbor wants a little more defensible space for, uh, for fire purposes. Uh, and here's just some additional pictures of the story poles. And this project was, uh, or this uh, presentation was made earlier, but our recommendation now is uh, for a continuance so we can look into those issues. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Um, with that, we have disclosures. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Leonard and I met with uh, Mr. Kent out on the site, and uh, we walked it, and I'm didn't learn anything different than what's in the report. I met Mr. Kent up there last week. Um, one of the a neighbor directly across the street on Harvester uh, came out towards the end of our meeting, and I'm drawing a total blank on his name right now. Um, but he, uh, I suggested, he had some concern. I suggested he stop, talk with Mr. Kent. Uh, his concerns were actually about <laughs> drainage and the stability of Harvester Road um, with uh, the recent rains that we had have. I guess there was some major drainage issues there. Looks to me like a lot of that stuff would be um, better contained actually once this development is completed um, there to redirect a lot of that water. But uh, that's what, I'm not an engineer. I just get to look at their plans. <laughs> so that's it. True. I did a walkthrough of the site last week with Mr. Kent and Dennis. Uh, I took John there on our field trip on Friday. I noticed it looks like a significant drainage course. There's a large culvert under the street. It is then a channelized culvert downstream by that neighbor, which conceals that it is a natural water course. Um, it, currently supporting both natives, including Sycamore, Toyone, and uh, just talking about what we observed from the street, and non-natives, including eucalyptus and queen palm. Um, I had asked the staff about, we had a letter from the neighbor talking about a complaint. I thought it had something to do with the 100 foot uh, versus 25 foot from Esha dispute, but it turned out to be about a code violation, and that's why it wasn't given to us. But other than that, um, I don't think I learned anything that's not in the staff report. John? And uh, exactly what Craig said, except I didn't, uh, I didn't check out the culvert. Okay. All right, so we've done disclosures. We have an applicant. We have some speakers. Um, probably for and against, I'm guessing. And do we have any hands online right now? Hand, raised hands? There's three, three raised hands right now. Three raised hands online. Four right. raised hands. So let's start out with uh, Stephen Kent, applicant. And I, I, maybe I should just say, I, I feel like there's a certain amount of impetus here to respect the staff's request to continue. And that I think what we're, we're, we're open-minded, we're 
subject to change if something all came together, but I think what we're really hoping to do is get some questions answered in a way that staff can frame up, reframe things as necessary, whatever that turns out to be. So with that said, Mr. Kemp, please come up. You've got 15 minutes. You can reserve any portion of that for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, before he speaks, I did speak to him yesterday on the phone for uh, 15 minutes. I didn't learn anything that wasn't in the staff report. Okay. We did speak actually today for a minute on the phone. Same thing. Correct. So I also spoke to him over the weekend. All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, commissioners. My name is Stephen Kent. <clears throat> I first moved to Malibu in 1997 at the age of 32. I raised my family here, and my daughter went to school at Webster. As an architect, I've specialized in designing and building high-quality homes in Malibu for the past 27 years. Although my wife and I have been living in Brentwood the past few years, we purchased this property on Harvester to hopefully build our house to live in and eventually retire back here in Malibu. We have several friends in the immediate Malibu Park neighborhood that we are looking forward to spending time with, and some of our closest friends are within walking distance away. I'm also an avid mountain biker and am very much looking forward to biking right out of my garage to some of the best trails in all of Malibu. As I'm sure you know, getting a new house approved by Malibu Planning Commission and all the city departments is a very arduous process. So I'm here before you tonight after city planning staff has rigorous, rigorously vetted my project to ensure that it meets all of the zoning and, and environmental codes. I think I've designed a beautiful house that is respectful of the neighbors, and I hope you agree. One last thing I will say is that a lot of spaghetti got thrown against the wall at the last minute today, and if you hear it out, none of it's going to stick. Um, all of the claims are completely baseless, and I'm fully prepared to discredit everything, so I hope Hope we can hear it out. And I, I really thank you for making the effort to hear the case um, instead of continuing it, because I, I, you know, whether it does go through or ultimately get continued tonight, I think it's going to be a very, very productive discussion. Thank you. Okay, and you've got uh, 13 minutes remaining for rebuttal. Um, I, you don't, nobody else here is part of your applicant team, right? So uh, let's go to the, Next person here will be Mr. Frank Angel, followed by Don Erickson. And you know you've got three minutes. Okay, um, this morning at 9.42, I sent an email to the city biologist, Matt Cannon, to please advise whether she actually visited the site and did a survey of the plant habitat that is potentially affected by the project. Whether it's on-site or off-site, that isn't the issue, whether whatever is potentially affected by the development and by the construction activity in the root zone. Um, I didn't get an answer. At eight, about 8 o'clock tonight, I emailed her again, and I said, I'm in the Planning Commission meeting. I would like to report to the commission, you know, whether you actually visited the site. And then I got finally the answer at, at 8.30, no, I have not visited the site. The LCP, in about three different spots, just in Chapter 4, or maybe chapter four and chapter five, talks about independent city biologist review. You do not hire a city biologist to do a desktop review by whatever the applicant produces you. And that's why she concluded, of course, there's no ESHA because that's what she was told by the applicant's own uh, consultant. And she just rubber stamped it 
and without site review, desktop top review says there's no ESHA. Well, three years ago, it was an ESHA, and we submitted these documents attached to our letters. My client, who is at 369 on the other side of the stream habitat, of the riparian habitat, the western sycamore t uh, trees, the California walnut, the two, uh, m the two um, or the more than two uh, oak trees. One is uh, actually two of them, I think, are valley oaks, and then the coast like oaks. She's just on the other side of it. It was an ESHA, and she had to redo the plans on a PV, on a planning verification, so that she would have the setback from the ESHA. Now, this site is 130 feet wide, so you couldn't build anything if you went by the normal ASHA rules, so your chapter four comes into place, and that's where you're finding what is the least environmentally damaging alternatives come in, comes into place. You have to then be able to build a house, but you have to set it back as much as you can from the ASHA, and that has not occurred here. And so all we have requested is this short continuance so that our biologist, the city biologist, and the applicant's biologist, to be fair, can all three meet with staff on site and be there with the surveys, where's the boundary, and then assess exactly what is on site, what is on the parcel, what is on the other parcel, and then also um, assess what the impacts are, because I finish in one second, the staff says there's no uh, uh, it's, it's more than 20 feet, the development is more than 20 feet from uh, the trees or from the drip line. That's also not correct. Development is defined as project activity, including construction activity. And that plan is uh, deferred to the future under your own conditions. That information where the construction staging and everything occurs has to be Chair, uh, okay. produced now. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Angel. Thank you. I, I like to let people finish their sentence. I didn't hear the period in there. Oh, okay. Hope you're okay. Um, all right. I'm sorry. Next, uh, we have Ms. Dawn Erickson, followed by Dominique Navarro. Welcome. My name is Dawn Navarro Erickson, and I've been a resident on this very property for 50 years. I've seen tremendous amount of change, which I tried to document in some of the uh, paperwork that has been forwarded to you. Um, basically, uh, I had to hire a spokesperson in order to clearly specify um, the situation here on this property. Um, please read the notes. I'm not a public speaker, so I ask that you review everything. And if I have a few more minutes, can I give it back to my attorney here? Unfortunately, that's not how things work. So you, no. got, you have two more minutes roughly for yourself Oh my here. gosh, two minutes. <laughs> All right, I think that um, my primary concern with this project is I don't know where the property line is. How do you determine where a plant, a tree, a 30-foot oak, a coastal live oak is if it looks like it's sitting in the middle of a fence that's been there for 30 years? What is the property line? Does he ha does Mr. Kent's responsibility include doing readable pr property lines? Um, when he cut down the toyon trees, I now believe that he cut down the toyon trees on his property. We did bring out a person I described in my notes. Um, his name is Abel Rodriguez, and he specializes in um, going out on property and surveying it with using the GPS, which is not accurate, but at least he gives some footing. Um, he looked at the fence line and he said it was four feet off. In places, the fence is a way, the chain link fence, as you see in the pictures, is a wavy line. We also brought out our naturalist, our ecologist, 
well-known people. They don't make up stories. They documented exactly what they saw. 29 seconds. Please review this property. Please consider the fact that the animals have been there much longer than us, and we would like those animals to go on for the next period of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we have next uh, Dominique Navarro. There's a note on here that says you have a video. Yeah, it's a two minute video. Okay. I don't really have come, come, come step up if you, oh. So you have a chair. Can I ask one question real quick? Please. Um, is a man by the name of Mr. Phillipson, do you have a speaker card for him? I do. Okay, so we got you. Okay. Um, right, so you have a two minute video and do you want to show that and speak a little or vice versa? We'll do the two minute video and then I, I'll just say my introduction mostly. I know just who I am. I'm a, a resident at three, the property with Dawn Erickson, I'm her daughter. And so this is a uh, footage from uh, many, many years of documenting our environment there. So I'll let the video speak. Okay, and we have, oh here, the video is up. Is there sound to it? So all of that is footage that I've taken for many years with a night camera, and uh, <laughs> I never planned that it would be used for any purpose, like defending this area, but it's, it's a really incredible habitat. I'm not an environmental photographer, but living at this property has just been a phenomenal experience of seeing this whole community. So we're very concerned with protecting it in any way. And we've always known it as to be an ESHA, going through the challenges of rebuilding this property after the fire and this entire ravine getting burned out. Um, it's been really wonderful to see it revitalize and grow back and we wanna make sure that it continues to be a supported environment there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Navarro. Uh, Tyler, we, I just, we saw a little graphic at the end there. Was that part of the video or something else? That was, that was I don't know, that went by so quickly. I don't know if that's something we can just put up at some point or maybe just tell us what it was if we need to refer to it. It's in, her, it's in Dawn's files. It's, it's, it's in our, something that's in our file, okay. All right, I, I just went by so quick I, didn't, I couldn't tell. Um, Mr. Phillipson, followed by Mr. Vort. And then Craig. Clinice Ross. Mr. Phillipson, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, 
My name is Paul Phillipson. We reside and own 30033 Harvester, which is the other side of this property that's being built. Um, appreciate the opportunity to try to talk and work through some issue, but primarily our house was built 50 years ago by Marshall Lewis, designed the contours so that they were all built so there wasn't a lot of grading required. The property that you're trying to build or evaluate, um, um, there, our house was given a variance of only 12 feet to the property line when it was built. The house that is proposed has also been somehow granted because of whatever the rules are, 13 feet six inches on the offset on their side. That puts us 25 feet apart, okay? They're building a 24 foot wall 25 feet from my house that's going to cover 100 feet of the property line. No contours, just runs on the property line design, not contoured to the hill at all. It increases the grading. It blocks everything. So you've been up to the site, you said, but not looked at it from my property line to this enormous 24-foot story pole that's literally covering our 50-year existing dwelling. Now, my understanding from the staff report, which was really hard to get through quickly, and honestly, it was a lot of work to get the architect, Lester Tobias, to help us and get letters filed today, which were handed to Rebecca Evans this morning. Okay, so it, it's, it was hard to get those compliance issues and understood these staff reports. The staff report says if there's any existing dwelling within 15 feet of the setback, it has to be shown on the site plan. Now our, our house is not shown on the site plan filed with you. You haven't even looked at the site plan with our house as it sits on the property. So I'm asking you to please evaluate that, come and look from our side, understand what an obstacle this is, and all we've asked is that this structure and plan be further pushed back away from our property. I stood and fought the Woolsey fire. Our house suffered but survived, okay? Because there wasn't a structure within 500 feet of our property. I, I need you to understand that the, the, the offset is, is just enormous and too close and seems to violate the staff report's own requirements. Please reevaluate. Please re Five seconds, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Phillips. And uh, Mr. Fort. Hi, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Dave Vort. Um, I live full time in Malibu uh, Park on the corner of Sea Star and Morning View. And Steve Kent, uh, as the architect, designed our house, uh, and we're extremely pleased with it. He's done really an amazing job on our house. We're extremely happy with the end result, which has taken into account not just our family needs, but aesthetically really blends into the community seamlessly. We've received many compliments from our neighbors, and they're all very appreciative to have such a thoughtful, well-designed, quality home next to theirs and in the community. I'm sure that Steve's new home will be just as beautiful as, as ours. I know that Steve purchased his property on Harvester to live there with his wife, and we're very much looking forward to having them as neighbors. I enthusiastically recommend that you please allow Steve to build his house as proposed, and I hope you vote yes for the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fort. And then finally, at least here in person, Mr. Clooney's Ross, am I pronouncing that right? All right. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me tonight. My name is Craig Clooney's Ross, uh, and I'm here in support of my very good friend Stephen Kent's project uh, at 30053 Harvester Road. Uh, we live right down the street. We have two properties at 29958 and 29960 Harvester Road. Uh, my wife's family purchased one in 1974. 
she uh, was raised there herself and then we took over the property um, and raised our own children there. Uh, we then ended up purchasing the property next door at 29958 Harvester Road. Um, we lost both everything on both properties in the Woolsey fire. We've since rebuilt uh, 29958. Um, and Stephen has designed the home at 29960, which is currently under construction. Uh, we also have received numerous compliments. Uh, it's posted on the fence what the house is. Um, I've seen all of Stephen's projects, including the, the homes he's lived in himself. Uh, they're all beautiful. Uh, we're very happy with what we have going. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing. We've lived in that neighborhood a long time, and we're well aware of the fact there's a, a very large, beautiful open lot right across from, from our property at 29960. And we're under no illusion that at some point that property will very probably be purchased and developed. Um, I can also attest to the fact that even on our, on our developed property that we live on now, I'm also a huge fan of, of, of the wildlife that's present in the neighborhood. And I can tell you with confidence, I have pictures and videos on my phone. Um, we were recently visited by four full-size coyotes on the property. I've documented well a um, great horned owlets that were born and raised um, on the border of our property um, recently. And um, we still have red tail hawks that are, that are on the property. So, you know, I still feel that the neighborhood has the appeal and the, the the beauty and the identity that it has had. And I also know that a couple of the properties, especially the one across the street when it's not well maintained and overgrown, is a far greater fire risk um, with, with untouched, unkept brush than what it would be if a home was there and it was properly kept, as we have to do with two acre, two, two acre properties of our own. So I hope you will allow this project to go forward because I do think it will be um, an asset to the neighborhood and not a detriment. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any raised hands in Zoom? There's four raised hands. First is Cooper Cass. Tell, tell us all the, the four names. Do, do, do they, spe they don't specify for or against or anything, right? It's just names. Do you want to read all the names? Um, all right, let's just take them in order then. Cooper Cass. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Good evening, I'm Cooper Cass. I'm an attorney at Angel Law along with Mr. Frank Angel. Uh, we represent Ms. Dawn Erickson, who lives at 30069 Harvester Road, which, as you've heard, shares a property line with the project site. Um, I'd hoped you had uh, reviewed our letter, which we submitted today. Uh, it describes in detail why this project cannot be found to be consistent with Malibu's local coastal program or CEQA's Class Three categorical exemption. You've now heard from Frank, whose comments I completely concur with, but I'd like to focus on the native trees, which Chapter 5 of the LIP is supposed to protect. In short, the city has not done its due diligence on this project, which you can tell because staff is asking you to have more time for due diligence. Planning staff accepted as gospel the biological inventory, if you can call it that, submitted by the applicant. The city biologist, quote, reviewed that report and concurred with its findings without ever setting foot on the property. After Ms. Erickson was informed of this application, she alerted city staff to the fact that the report was dramatically off the mark. In response, city staff released a supplemental staff report just before the weekend, which one, misrepresented Ms. Erickson's contentions, two, dismissed them as irrelevant in favor of, quote, the project applicant's suggestion that the protected trees are too small to be protected, and three, admitted that staff didn't even bother to confirm the size of the native trees. Staff even had the gall to tell Ms. Erickson that she would need to hire a biologist four days before the hearing to be taken at all seriously by the commission. Well, Ms. Erickson took staff up on that challenge and contrary to the applicant's inventory and the city biologist's quote unquote review, not to mention staff's original contention that there are no native trees on or adjacent to the subject parcel, this biologist observed not just one immature sycamore and one toyone, 
but at least three coast live oaks, two valley oaks, seven sycamores, eight toyones, and four black walnuts along the property line. Some of these native trees even appear to be on the project site. How can you possibly rely on a biological report that missed or worse omitted all of these native trees? Staff's conclusions, including the least environmentally damaging alternative conclusion, all rely on the applicant's faulty, unconfirmed, and now discredited report. Commissioners, the bigger question for you to answer here tonight, which I know you've all grappled with before, is this. Do the words codified in the Malibu Local Coastal Program actually mean anything? Or do they just exist as purely temporary speed bumps for the rubber stamping of irresponsible coastal development? At a minimum, we advise that you vote to continue this item to allow for proper consideration of the actual conditions at the project site. Otherwise, anything goes in Malibu. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, who's next? Robert Kerbeck, followed by Ed O'Neill. Robert, can we hear you? Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. I am the neighbor that Commissioner Peak met the other day. And I have to admit to being a little surprised that he didn't remember my name because I wrote the only book about our terrible fire, a book called Malibu Burning. As a result, I am now a national wildfire expert and also considered to be a Malibu historian. I have lived across the street from the property in question for 25 years. It was wonderful to see my neighbors, Paul and Craig, who both were incredibly generous and supportive and kind during the terrible fire. Um, and I know they're on different sides of this issue, but I wanted to bring up a different item um, because some of the other ones are being dealt with by some of my other neighbors. One of my big concerns is safety in terms of traffic and parking. This property has five structures on it, and yet there is no place to park on the street in front of the property. If you commissioners please come out to the property, you will see that we are the only property that has not taken away street parking. All of the other properties, three or four to my left, three or four to my right, have no place for anyone to park. We've had two accidents on this stretch of Harvester Road where people have gone over the edge because there's a, it's kind of a straight area and so people get too much speed. And so if you have a situation where you have a lot of cars parking on the side of the road, trucks stopping in the, in the middle of the road because there's no parking, it creates a very dangerous situation. And so I'm concerned that we have five structures and yet there's no parking. And I think that's dangerous. And I would really appreciate it if you would come out and take a look at that and make sure that this property and the driveway and the driveway gate is designed in a way so that cars can easily, when they pull up to that property, get off of the road and be safe. Thank you so much for your consideration. All right, thank you. Who's next? Ed O'Neill. Ed O'Neill, can you hear us? Can we hear you? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Ed O'Neill and my family is currently in the process of building on Cuthbert. And uh, the neighbor in front of me and on the side has, uh, we're going through the same process, but I feel everybody should want to be a good neighbor. And there's a lot of hostility I hear on this and it's very unfortunate. My neighbor in front of me wanted to build 28 foot with pitched roofs. I, I don't, I, I think people aren't realizing how negative a project this really could be. It does seem like Steve Kent has worked to, to bury the project into the ground, that it looks like it steps, steps in both directions, toward the street and, and the other way, the east-west as well. And I think the style is terrific. I think it's the direction that whole Malibu Park, the, the rebuilds are frankly much nicer than, than the homes that existed. I think there is a good neighborhood. I think Steve's a great architect and a good guy. And I think he should be able to build. I, I think he's shown a lot of sensitivity. And for a, a guy who's shown so much sensitivity as he has, I, I wish the people would be uh, much kinder towards him and welcome him to the neighborhood. I certainly will. And I look forward to having Steve and his new wife as my neighbors. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Neill. We have what, one more? 
The last hand is Edith Reed, but I think she's part of the applicant team. Uh, yes, right. Or is she right? Yes. Yes, uh, but we do have 13 minutes remaining in applicant do, team do, time. Do you want to have her? Uh, she, her hand is raised. Apparently, she wants to speak. Bring it up to Steve. Isn't it? Yeah, I guess it's, it's your team. Yes, so you I'm get here. To decide. Steve, do you, hang on, uh, Ms. Reed. Uh, Steve, what, what, do you want her to speak? Come to the podium, and you've got 13 minutes of rebuttal left. Sure. Um, the plan was to just have Edith available to answer questions as they arise. Um, if if it's okay, I'd like to go through my rebuttal, and if there's extra time, uh, maybe Edith can chime in afterwards. Mm -hmm. Got a clock there? You're the boss. I'm the boss? No. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> I wish. Rebecca Clark? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, let's see, where do I begin? Uh, well, I hope that you take the neighbor's claim of an imaginary Esha at face value. The neighbor just finished building her own house, and now this is obviously a not in my backyard situation. Before I purchased my property, I made absolutely 100% sure that my property was nowhere near a designated Esha. Um, please see slide one of the Malibu Esha map. As you can see, it's nowhere near a designated ESHA. Um, this was confirmed both by the Malibu City Planning and the Malibu City Biologist. <clears throat> Please see slide two, Malibu City Biology approval stating no ESHA or no stream. I also had my bio biologist Edith Reed confirm that there is no ESHA or no stream and to also take a biological inventory of my property, not my main neighbor's property. Edith confirmed that there are no native protected trees located on my property. Edith is a very well respected and conservative biologist who has been working in Malibu for many years. Edith is in attendance via Zoom tonight to answer questions that might arise. Uh, with regard to the toy on bushes, last uh, spring I had a crew do uh, uh, brush clearing along the, the fence line. Uh, please see slide three. In particular, there was a lot of dead wood that had accumulated along the fence at our western property line. Um, during the brush clearance required for the fire department, there were some small toy on bushes that were cut along the fence row but nothing was anywhere near the size of a protected tree. Um, however, interestingly enough, as you can see in the same photograph, the, the neighbor evidently cleared her brush with little regard to the, her newly claimed Esha. You can see many tracks from heavy equipment that apparently clear cut her vegetation all the way to her side of the fence row. All except for a big row of eucalyptus trees on her property, which are non-native, invasive, and a big fire hazard. Please see slide four, showing the line of the seven big eucalyptus trees and Ms. Erickson's recently completed house. Uh, the neighbor Robert actually pointed out to me that these large eucalyptus trees were likely the reason why her, her, her house burnt down in the fire. As the firestorm came from the east, as Craig can attest as he went through this when he stayed to try to save his house. There was a huge wall of flames that blew from the east, and you're looking from east to west here. Those, uh, Robert says that those trees ignited and blew embers all over Miss Erickson's house and probably was the reason why it burned down. Um, contrary to Miss Erickson's claim, city planning staff has researched the file for her project and found no mention of ESHA or any restrictions on what she built. Um, and to address the, the concerns that, or the letters that were written at the last minute today, I'd like to make a few points. Um, uh, first of all, my biology report by, was done by a certified biologist, which, and I, I think her 
so-called experts are an ecologist from Channel Islands and some landscape guy with a GPS to measure boundaries. Um, so, uh, you know, I've hired professionals, I've hired legitimate credentialed people to, to do, you know, all the due diligence on my property and it was all properly done and everything conforms. Um, if you look at the, the map that uh, Ms. Erickson uh, presented, she's got a bunch of colored dots on her side of the property claiming uh, um, protected trees, but they're, they're not protected even by her own labeling. They're all like small bushes and shrubs and nothing anywhere near the size of a protected tree. And there's only one lone tree that she's claiming is protected and it's an oak tree near the rear of the property. Um, uh, and that oak tree is on her property. Um, it's not on mine. And my structure is at least 20 feet away from it. So I'm not trying to do anything with her valued trees. Um, you know, I, I don't have any. It's very clear that I don't have any protected trees on my property. It's very clear that it's not mapped ESHA and, and never was. Um, so uh, with regard to getting a surveyor out, well, I, I already had a surveyor. You know, my, I have a licensed stamp surveyor that's, that's stamped my drawings. He did, a, he did an overlay with the aerial photography and I followed up with him on that today. Um, you know, he laughed when, he, when I told him there was some landscape dude with the GPS trying to find the property corners and the fence row. And he, he laughed at the fact that, you know, that fence could be four feet off from the property line. He, he has all aerial imagery and photographs and he knows where that fence is and it, it doesn't deviate nearly that much as four feet. So, um, so like I said, I think this is just a lot of spaghetti against the wall. It has no credibility. I think everything that I've done on my side is extremely credible, well-researched by professionals. Um, so if, if the only concern is that the city biologist hasn't looked at this, then I would suggest you do what you did on item 5B tonight. Why not approve the project and have the city biologist go out and verify that there's no native protected trees on my property? You can see from the aerial image in the previous exhibit, the, the property is totally clear. There's nothing on my property. So why, why, you know, continue this and drag me through the mud over something that's gonna be very obvious and can be easily checked, just like what you did on 5B tonight, having staff go out and check the fence in the stream. And there was also another project that I had in Point Doom where Mr. Mazet uh, suggested the same thing. It was approved, uh, I'm not sorry, sorry, not on Point Doom, on Broad Beach, on the bluff. And the project was approved, but Mr. Mazza requested that we do an erosion study after the fact, just to put everything to bed. But, you know, it was an academic situation, just like this is an academic situation. So <clears throat> with regard to my other neighbors to the east, while I am mindful of their concerns of our two houses being in close proximity to one another, my house fully complies with the prescribed setbacks. I cited our house to maximize ocean view, and that is why it is where it is. Um, please see slide five. So this is a site plan. It has the neighbor's house on it. Uh, I will tell you that the neighbor's house has been on all of my plans since day one. It, it was fully reviewed by planning staff for the past year with the neighbor's house on it. Uh, inadvertently, right before the hearing, when I put the package together, that layer got turned off in my CAD program and it got printed without the neighbor's house. 
But here you have it tonight with all the proper measurements on it and planning staff has had eyes on this for a full year reviewing it. And frankly, planning staff didn't care about the neighbor's house. Why? Because my project complies with all the required setbacks and the neighbor's house doesn't have any bearing on that. And the fact that they're saying now that they even got a reduced setback is quite ironic. So they've got, they got a reduced setback, they got a break from the city, and so now I'm supposed to be penalized. 50 years ago. Okay, sure. Come on, it doesn't hey, matter hey, when. Let's it doesn't it matter when, but you know, the fact of the matter is they got a break, so now they want me to be penalized. And the fact of the matter is the houses are nearly 30 feet apart. They're not close together. And I'll show you all kinds of other examples of houses in Malibu Park that have, you know, less, this amount of setback or way less. So, um, but before I get to that, let me get back on track here. Um, getting back to what I did with the design, uh, I've pushed our house down well into the grade, back to the lot to be respectful of the neighbors. Um, and, I didn't put it on my slide, but maybe we can come back to it. Uh, if you look at the elevation of the house, uh, and you also look at the story poles, the house is not 24 feet in the air. You can look at the elevation drawings on, on your drawing sets there, and if you look at the elevation that the neighbors are looking at, the story poles in the back are 10 feet high, and the highest story pole is under 20 feet. So it's not like they're looking at a 24 foot wall. I was very conscientious in designing the house. I pushed it all down into the grade. You can see on that same elevation, it all steps down with the grade. And it was very mindful of the neighbors. So when asked for his opinion on the, the matter, their architect, their architect uh, Lester Tobias, first told the Philipsons the same thing when they looked at my plans. The, he said they were, I'm sorry, they were, hold, hold up for a second. Mr. Philipson, we need you to be quiet and respect. Everybody gets their time and there's a process we have here. So I, it's, it's, I, I, I appreciate you're frustrated. I probably would be just as frustrated, but we need it, need to let it give it, give him his time. Thank you. So I spoke to Lester Tobias and he told me that he first told the Philipsons that they were lucky to have such a well-designed house. Uh, next door to them, and he also pointed out the same thing, how the house was stepping into the grade to be less visible to them, and he also pointed out that I have hardly any windows on that side of the house to respect their privacy. Um, and also I'd point out, if you look at my plans, the, the second floor of the house is pushed way back. On this plan, you can see it's the dotted line uh, that you can see there cutting across the house. That's the second story and everything in back of that. Uh, the second story, everything to the right of it is one story. And everything is stepping down the grade. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Philipson? Okay, thank you. Proceed. Okay. Yeah, we'll, sure, sure, we'll give you a little. You've got 48 seconds nominally, but we'll give you another half a minute. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I pushed the second story back. I've pushed the house way down. The house steps into the hillside. There's a lot of one story views. I, I really wish uh, you're able to look at that elevation. I'm not sure if it's on 3.1 or 3.2. 3.1, yeah, yeah. So um, with that, let's take a look at slide six, please. So the Philipsons have asked that I should push my house further down the hill away from them. But the whole reason why we bought this property is because we have this ocean view. And I realized if I pushed it up at the top right hand corner of the site, that I could, you know, we could have a pretty nice ocean view. But the problem is the more I push it away down the hill, you can see it only takes a few feet and those power lines are creeping right up into our blue water view 
And if, they, if we pushed it as far as the Philipsons wanted us to push it, uh, it would go into our horizon view, which would be totally unacceptable. So the fact that they got a reduced setback. Finish uh, up, wrap up to the idea. Okay, the fact that they got a reduced setback uh, shouldn't penalize us for getting what we're entitled to. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, we, with, we're gonna close the public portion of the hearing. So thank you, we're available for questions. We're back up to the commission table. Is there is there any way that they that you can see the slides that I didn't get to? No, no. I mean, if yeah, if the if the if the commission wants to, it's in their prerogative, but they're not mandated to. No. Okay. Um, it, okay. There there are a number of issues here, both that pertain to this watercourse slash ESHA, real or not. There are other issues separate from that about the house and the design and code things. Um, it sounds to me that just as a first cut that the proposed remedy sounds collaborative and reasonable, that they get the both the dueling biologists out there on the site, they have a conference, they see what's actually there and get, get people to, to agree what is and isn't. Is that something that we want to, I mean. It, well, I don't think that's what's legally required. Okay, the way well, I read this. Okay, well, this, okay, I'm putting that out there as, as something that might be something that we could get to. There are other things to discuss no, before we get I'm there. No, what I'm saying but. getting to it is, what we have here, unfortunately, is a situation where, number one, we're being, the definition of ESHA is not being considered. They're talking about this is on my property, that's on your property. Yeah. It doesn't matter who's on property yeah. if you are near an ESHA, okay? Fence doesn't matter, okay? Now, the, the thing that staff has to reconcile. Um, can we ask staff whether or not it's ESHA? No. Well, we can't ask them that? We, we, we no, no, here's we why. Let me finish, please. Okay. I, I didn't know we couldn't ask them that, because well, as far as I know, it's not. Well, yeah. as far as I know, it's officially designated as ESHA by our staff and their biologists, okay? Yeah. You did not read the, what you got today. Okay. If you, if you read the record, there is a presumption in the record now established by the city that this is ESHA. Based, based, on, on, based on based on a memo. Based on, based on one forwarded email that requires some thing. No, based on Post the fact that Woolsey there's. Fire saying that no, it no, may or no, may not have been it. ESHA. Did you, read, did you read Cornell's email? I read like 30 emails today. Okay, well, did you read the one from, from the staff that says this is an ESHA? We uh, must move back. Who said that? Uh, let me read it. It's Philip Col Colonel, Colonel. Yeah, uh, how long ago was that? He's been gone from the city for two years. February, two years. listen, February 26, 2021, in regard to Erickson's parcel, when they were trying to do their PV, and could they do a PV, or did they need a, a full permit? He wrote, Richard and I looked over the proposal and determined that we can keep this as a PV. What he would like to see is for you to recalculate the required setbacks for only the flat portion of the property, most likely only the building pad, and exclude the rest of the slopes since it is considered ESHA. Okay, now there were several other emails in the same vein that confirmed that this is where they were going. And then that. there's this. I was just going to ask Richard if it's Escher or not, because he's sitting right here. And, and I think what we're, well. Well, what I'm can, trying yeah. to get at is, is give Richard time to come back to us at the next hearing and say, how can one applicant have to not get a setback because it's Escher? And two years later, change your mind. That's a yeah. reasonable. Yeah. yeah. That's and a reasonable. That's what we need to have. That's why I don't want to get us in them in legal trouble and us in legal trouble and have this thing go on forever and ever and ever. And then you have this this particular document, which you got today, that is was the landscaping and ESHA re restoration requirements by the city and the fire department. And there's the ESHA, big green line, ESHA, okay? Is so, it mapped? What? Is it mapped? Is it legally mapped? Well, okay. Yes. So let's, let's be clear. Whether or not it's on the official LCP map, is not at all dispositive. It creates an original uh, initial assumption, but 
biologists, experts can look at that and, and say, yes, it is, or no, it isn't, based on, so well, it's, the it's fact that it is that. or isn't on the map is, is it's not. It's more than that. The we're, LC, we're beyond that now. The LCP Let's, specifically says mapped ESHA does not mean ESHA. Anything can be ESHA if it's determined to be ESHA. Yeah. It's specific in that. Let, let's hear okay? from guys. And let's it's also her. specific, once an ESHA, it cannot be destroyed. Okay? It must wow. be. And so they had a fire, boom, it's gone. That doesn't mean it's not an ESHA anymore. It by specifically in the LIP, it says it is. So we need to find out where we stand because part of being a planning department, part of being codes is to be consistent and treat everybody equally. Okay? So that's what we have to have them come back and determine. We, we don't want to get in battle over, over things that cannot be determined. We have a staff documents that say they determined it was Escher. Okay? okay. Now we need to know why, since since you can, let me finish. Since you can't you can't destroy an Escher, why they were wrong in the past and why they made them move their house. Okay. We have, we have to, we need to know that. And, it needs and, to be resolved. And Look. then we also need to realize that that Mr. Kent was describing, it's not on my property, which is totally irrelevant to ESHA, totally irrelevant, okay? And so th it's if a complicated it's situation. If it's ESHA, it doesn't seem like it to me. It's not math, Well, you don't John. determine it because staff's already determined it. Now they have to determine why they made a mistake if they made a mistake. So the other part of the Skyler, Drew's been No, I was going to just say, uh, I think that we should get a clarification from the planning department and the city attorney in regards to how we are supposed to proceed with this. Exactly. Exactly. That's, I, that's you know, we can't, we can't sit here today. We have a, we have a, a, apparently we have a biologist who never visited the site. So we can't, we don't have evidence right there. Uh, so we have to have it come back to us, and we have to discuss it. Because it wasn't mapped. Okay, the, the mapping Again, is... Again, if you would read the LIP sometime, you would realize right, that right, mapping okay. means Chair. nothing as We're, far as... Chair, pushing. this is... Both of you, this is being redundant now, okay? okay? Both of you. Okay. Now, I have a comment, which is... Skylar, yeah. What, what's strange to me in this is that had it been very clear that the house adjacent was required to be moved because it was ESHA, I think that we would have a lot more documentation of that that would be very explicit. Not, I saw the email, I saw that I have the, was just looking back at the same page you're referencing. I don't see that here, so I'm not, I don't have the old house that no. was approved and done under a yeah. fire rebuild in front of me, like all the documentation with that. So they can bring it back well, to part, part, part of that is it's a PV and this is post Woolsey and they're like, just go, 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 like give them their house, like, they're not, and, but so, even in that climate, they said, oh, hang on, you need to move it back because there's ESHA here. But then how do we get to a place whereby we're being shown photos of them disking what you're referencing as ESHA? So that doesn't add up to me. Well, when, wait, wait, wait. When, what does disking have to do with it? Can't Since when can you disc Esha? You well, can't. What, who's talking I'm, just, about I'm asking you a question. Well, that's that's who's point. talking about it? Did you? I mean, there was yeah, a clear can, slide showing it. You can disc Esha. You have to restore it. Okay, that's what we're going through so, on the wetlands right now. I well, they no, I don't think that's a good enforcement. Do you do you realize how much it. do you realize how much Esha I had to dodge up on top of the hill at Tuna Canyon? You can't go through anything. So, I and I had to mark plan. it. I, I had, to, I had your, to. I looked at the aerial I had on your to, website, and it does not match what was approved. Okay, so we're going to focus on what's yeah, in front of us. Yeah, let's not talk about Tuna Canyon. So, so, so my, all I'm saying, Skyler, is all they have to do is come back and give us an answer. We can't answer it now. So I, I can. It's I not understand mapped. what you're saying. I just, it becomes very frustrating in the spot. Like, look at, you guys have a very. Look at how beautiful the video that was shown to us. Like, first off, we're also fortunate to live in a place like this. If we can modify things a little bit and preserve a little bit of that, that behooves us to do that, right? I know you have a very responsible architect here. 
clearly when you look at the elevations he's tried to respect the contour of the land he's completely maximizing the ability of his land by having a great view of the ocean that's awesome that as any other property owner should be allowed to do what's really difficult for us is the fact that we have the conflicting uh ecologist biologist uh different no not no. yet I was just commenting on the fact that I, I think we're all very fortunate. I have nothing against no. you. Know, I know that. Okay, we we, we, we uh, can't have this back and forth. Skyler, sorry. sorry. This, this is so, sort of a, we don't need to discuss this because. But, John. They, we need the information. and you, 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 you So can't. you think that if you get the information and that comes back and that says it's not ESHA, that you're not going to have them change something here. Or if it is Esha, what would you have them change? Would you have them move the guest house and garage, the ADU and garage? I don't know. I don't know the, what the, what the situation is. It's not in front of us. Yeah. But okay. if, 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 it's, if the code says you got to move back, you got to move back. If it doesn't, you don't. But, uh, but if, if we want to get clarification on whether or not it's Esha and bring that back, I am that's, okay That's with that. what we're now, there, now I think we should go on to... I want to be to, very concise in what but, that is. Uh, but I think there's other problems with this property. Yeah, let, let's, let's, let's table that for the yeah, moment. Drew, Drew has a comment. Look. I just wanted to ask Mr. Kent if he wanted to respond to this. No. Um, no, I'm going to say no as chair, as my prerogative. An open-ended uh, please respond is not a appropriate. Sorry. If you have a specific question that you need answered, that's okay. Do you have a response to this? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Do you want to be here till <laughs> two? Because I'll ask them questions. It, it, we've closed the public hearing. Okay. If we have limited to very specific things, that's what he's here for. Otherwise, we're not having a back and forth here. Just, okay. I, I'm I, trying to do. That's what April 15th is. That's what April 15th is. Na na nail it down more specifically. Can, can each and we'll get commissioner to it. make sure that their microphone is on when they make comments yeah. just for the, the and, teleconference? And try to avoid talking over one another. Yeah. And uh, b b before we move on to any other, other, other issues that may be on the table, I'd just like to point out a couple things on, on this point. One, and this may speak to why it was called an ESHA in the first place, assuming it was based on the record we do have. The LCP definition of a stream is a topographic feature that at least periodically conveys water through a bed or channel having banks. This includes water courses having a surface or subsurface flow that supports or has, su or has supported riparian vegetation. So it may be that they're looking at this now, and if that's the case, when you looked at the when you're looking at the opponent's color coded map, it seems like part of the discrepancy here is that the stream, we'll call it a stream, we can put it in quotes if need be, is on both properties. The riparian vegetation supported by it is mostly, but not entirely, on the Erickson side. But if you're looking at that as a system, as a, as in any sort of ESHA, then you have to be looking at the the, the soil, the roots, the, the, the drip lines, the, the, and, and to my mind, that's something that the biologists figure out on site. And they, uh, on site. Um, I don't disagree with you. The only problem yeah. here is that the city biologist has said that it's not actually. But we've already heard that the city biologist hasn't even looked at it. I, I think that's really problematic. Because it wasn't mapped. If what I may jump are you in, talking yeah. about okay. Read the sure. LIP. Sure. Let's, let's, let, let's, yeah. If I may jump in, please do not bash the city biologist. It is standard protocol that she does not visit the property unless there is something unique that warrants it, like a variance or some sort of question in the report. The city biologist, and this is not just our current biologist, but past biologists utilize a number of tools the city has, including aerial photographs to go back to 1993, to do their research. So it is not uncommon that the biologist not visit the site. So please be respectful of our biologist. All right, thank, thank you, Richard, for that clarification. Okay, can, I think we should go on to the problems, the other problems with it. I would like to ask one question on this environmental aspect that might be relevant if if they're going to be relooking at it. This is of Attorney Angel, right? Be as limited and constrained as possible. 
You wrote that the staff report offers no clue why none of the six exceptions to the class three CEQA categorical exemptions apply to the project. Can you, I, I'm not sure what you were talking about. Um, why, why does this differ from other projects in the city that might be next to ESHA where CEQA exceptions to exemptions are not invoked? Well, um, as an initial matter, um, you have to explain to the Planning Commission why these six exceptions don't apply. And I agree, some of them don't apply, but I think two at a minimum do apply, and staff should address those. And those are the ones of the cumulative impacts and those of the uh, especially sensitive habitat, the critically sensitive habitat. Um, you are in the San Mica Mountains zone, you're in the coastal zone, which the legislature has designated an area of critical environmental sensitivity. It's in the code. And if you are in such an area, the exceptions to the CEQA exemptions don't apply. So that's the substance of it. But even before you get to the substance, staff has to explain to you so that you can make intelligent findings why exceptions okay. don't that, apply. That's, that's good. I think we have that in the record, and staff can, can reflect on that. And, um, you know, on the ESHA, uh, I just would no, 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 no. direct no, commissioner. Fair is fair. Okay. Fair is fair. It's not fair. I, I yeah, I know. Like, that's a very short question to ask. All right, I, I, I did ask him a quick question, so you can. No, you ask him a question. Hang on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, 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 yeah. chair, chair. Why yeah. can't you gotta, speak? Got some control Why can't my biologist speak? You guys are talking about ESHA all this time, and you haven't let any of the experts speak. He's not an expert. <laughs> he all right, expert. all right, the hearing is closed. Speak. Please let sit down, speak. both of you, please sit down. Um, I, I realize this is, you know, a lot is on the line for everybody here, and we, we need to just try to step back and put the issues on the table and not be too personally involved with them, as, as, as difficult as that is. Um, John, you said you had other issues, yeah. I, I, as do I, but go ahead. Okay. Um, th these are all real close to the limits on square footage and everything. Um, on the basement, uh, was the I didn't have time to look up. Is the area that the uh, second exit is that to our our design standards? It seems bigger than normal. Uh, and was that scattered counted in the TDSFs? Speaking of the light well, correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that's part of the reason we issued a supplemental report is to make sure it was done correctly. Um, it measures four feet wide as the basement policy requires. There is a, a two foot gap uh, for a planter, but that planter does not um, daylight more than three feet, which is consistent with the code. And it was counted as square footage. 970 square feet is the total of the basement. And that includes that includes the light wall. That's correct. Okay, and uh, and it, okay, and then the second question I had was the guest house or the accessory dwelling unit, whatever you want to call it, um, which would be A two five. And as I understand it, we don't have ADUs yet. It has not passed coastal. So we're now under the 900 square foot limit. This is two buildings. There is no there. It's it's not 900 square feet. It's 400 and plus another building. Okay, it's two, and you only get one. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay, so so what I don't understand is. why you get two, because he's got two here. What, what, yeah. you're, you're taking two buildings and adding them together and counting them as one. What, yeah, John, no, what, what sheet are you looking at? I'm and can we put A that on the screen five. for everybody to look at? Say it again, A-2.5. A dash dash I don't know if you have that. It's, it was in our printed material. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed this too. I don't think we even talked about this, but um, You've got approximately, well, the problem is that the, is the breezeway. If it's, if, it's, if it's not enclosed, then you've got two separate units if you treat it as, as 
uh, this is just open air, it's not habitable air space or whatever. If it is enclosed, then the square footage of it, in addition to both sides, puts you over the 900 square foot limit significantly. So it, either way, it doesn't work. So right, it's either two units or it's over the 900 square foot limit. So, so that's an answer. You know, I'd like to have you guys come back with how do we make this a legal uh, well, accessory dwelling unit? If I may jump in and ask the question, the city's planning commission has approved, and there's a project on Malibu Road under construction right now, the Conheim project, where it's actually a series of different, of separate buildings. It has a common foundation but breezeways connecting, the, the owner wanted an Italian villa feel. Uh, it has breezeways connecting, like this, the, the, built, the room, the, the house together. And it, one could argue it's multiple dwelling units or one could say it's one house, and that's how the Planning Commission saw it, and they also saw it as one structure for the point of two thirds. So we'd be glad to hear the Planning Commission's direction on this, and it's something that staff, if this is something the commission wants and there's the, the majority for it, um, you could help me here, Pat, so I get a formula right, but it could be a, a modification that the homeowner make to address the concern by the commission. Well, I remember well, the Kondheim project and, and the, the dwelling units were not separated by, they were all in two buildings and one was counted as a guest house, one was counted as a house. There were other ancillary units that were not dwellings, okay? That's a big difference. If, we're, you we're, can we're, have, if you can have, when you're required to only have one ADU and have a two, two 450s, you've got two, two, two rental units, okay? And that's not what our code says. And, and uh, Richard, that, that's, that's, I think, a problem. Now, we, have, we may have a solution. I don't know when. Coastal hears this, and when it becomes a thousand square foot or whatever the new ADUs are, but this is two buildings you can live in. I'd like to point out to the commission if you look at the definition of building enclosed, that's an enclosed space. It's more than 60%. What's enclosed? The breezeway. That breezeway is more than 60% closed. Okay, so then my, my observation then would be that it should be counted as square footage, which if you add it to the other two sides, puts you over the 900. Yeah, all, I, all I'm asking is you come back with reconcile yeah. this. Well, can I just add real quick? Um, I apologize for, uh, we, we did go over this. We, we had a feeling this might be an issue, but as Richard <laughs> said, we've uh, allowed it in previous projects. So the applicant did have a secondary design uh, that uh, fully encloses that space. So it would be, you know, a hallway uh, and then they shaved off some square footage within the same footprint to accommodate and to make sure they're within 900 square feet. So I don't know if Steve is privy to that. Uh, I've seen a design that would comply if Please. this was an issue tonight. Uh, so there is, you know, just well, for your information. Make a decision and come back to us is all I'm asking is I don't want to be approving two accessory dwelling units when half the town wants to start dragging trailers onto their property right. and, and doing it. And so, Chair, I just want to be sure that, that the staff doesn't make that decision. Staff is looking for direction from the council. The direction the from the tonight. council the is to come back with an accessory dwelling unit mm -hmm. that is a, what is allowed in the code, one, okay? And not accessory dwelling units, it's now called an ancillary. What, what do we have until it passes? Or tell me when they're going to change it to 1,000 square feet and it's easy fix. But it's now 900. The law hasn't passed yet. Okay, that's all I'm asking is, it's, it I seems like an easy done. fix. I have a question about your question. So you're, if that's going to get passed by Coastal in three months from now, right? And you're aware Maybe. of that. Maybe. Okay. 99.5% chance. Well, yeah, but the, okay. I'll let me ask the attorney. The, the answer to your question is, we cannot approve something to be code when the code hasn't passed. So I just want to be clear that if he has an alternative design that he's just referencing right now that makes it compliant, are you okay with that? Yeah, if they come back and show us a, a plan that has one accessory dwelling unit, 
if it's 900 feet, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's just, I don't want to open up people popping yeah. these things. Yeah. I used to live next to, a, as you know, I lived yeah. next to a okay. guy that had 12 of them. Yeah, next. At one time. Next. Okay, okay. so. Pretty awesome, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was. Wasn't it? Yeah, you made the neighborhood nice. Um, Who's running this show anyway? Well, my next question on that same building is, and this is a, a, a I don't know the answer. Uh, do accessory dwelling units have to be, or do ancillary? It's right? a guest house or it's a second unit? Second right unit. Now. Do second units have to follow the two-thirds rule? Yes, but as Richard mentioned, the enclosed space is uh, being used as part of the structure. And so we, again, in the past, we have used uh, uninhabitable uh, covered spaces as part of the two-thirds calculation. And that's what's being done here. The, the ADU, whatever you want to call it, second unit, and the, you know, the two parts of it are on the lower level. Uh, on the upper level is the uh, detached garage. But the garage only covers the smaller unit. Understood, but again... So that doesn't make it... Oh, John, I think we've already crossed the bridge no, but it's here. Not we, covered. We, they have just said, we need to tighten it up and bring it under 900. And once they do that, the the you'll count the whole base as The two-thirds will fall, but as it well, stands well, now, it, it doesn't qualify. Again, we let it go because it's been allowed in the past to use covered areas for these things. Now, but it's not covered. We Where understand there's a, there's a, it's an issue of concern. So the applicant was willing to just kind of appease that, you know, issue and just enclose everything so it, it checks all those boxes without a gray area. You're talking about when, what I'm saying is, is how is it covered now? It's a it's a covered breezeway. I don't see it covered. There is a it's like a deck. Yeah, no, it's they're gonna ha they're gonna have to redesign it one way or the other. So well, I, the, the the second floor the, the two thirds problem goes away. The second floor plan shows a planter up there. It's not a deck, but whatever. Uh, okay, so you're gonna that, that's the one thing that has to come back as far as I'm concerned. One thing I'd like to know from planning staff is, did you have any interaction with the owners immediately to the north of there? Because it looked, from the street, it looked like this would block view. Did they, do they have a PVD? Have, were, have, are they in the loop at all? And their ocean view is way higher. You think? Yeah. I mean, we did way some, higher. Way higher. Go drive on Cuthbert. Walk, way higher. Walk down a vacant lot and have a look yourself. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So that it was just a question. Um, I'll say for the record to say something nice here that the uh, Mirica is great for the front edge because that's easier to keep at 42 inches than some of the other stuff we see. Um, although it was spelled wrong on the plan. Uh, California wax myrtle. Also, that's it's a really nice move putting the driveway down lights under the the laurel and the olive trees because that gives an extra bit of. Uh, Shade against the back scatter from the ground coming up, so that's that's a nice thing to see. Um, all right, so what do we have on the table here? We, uh, we have a let motion. Let me ask one last question because it, this came up at the speakers, and that is, do you have a traffic management plan in this application? Since that is a really narrow road with no parking. So. Or, or beyond that, how is the parking spec just to? Just a review, because that's not something... Well, they're okay. They're okay on it? Yeah. Well, I'm right. just saying construction parking management plan. John, once they cut a road up there, they're going to be parking up there on the site. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't live on a street that has four houses being built right now. If there is a concern about construction activities with this commission, uh, we've done this in the past. We could work on the language. But we have added a condition at the commission's request that a construction staging, management, parking plan, uh, thinking of a house a particular on Point Doom, uh, where there was a concern about, it was on Cliffside, I want to say, and there was a concern about worker parking and that That's the commission wanted them, the owner, to secure a lot to ensure that uh, workers were parking off, off the street. So if there is a concern as part of the motion, uh, we can craft language for a condition requiring a, a construction parking plan or staging plan whatever is the commission's concern. But most likely, in situations like this, yes, they want to park the materials and employees on site. 
Yeah. Well, I just brought that up because of the comment by the neighbor. Um, so uh, did, I, I did. Were, did they require that for when the neighbor's houses were built? I'm not aware of requiring one. Okay. Yeah, but you've been there. All right. Um, I moved away. Patrick, you. Patrick, what, what do we have? We have a motion on the table, right? No, I've, no? I, I've heard no, no motion. I'm oh, making okay. a motion. I'm, we continue this item till April 15th. For. For any uh, any other specificity? So to well, give time to, to we gave them the, the information they we so wanted to find out, and they come back to us. Rebecca, I'm going to second it and try to make some clarifications if John's amenable to that, which is to clarify the ESHA, if there's ESHA there, and to clarify the size of the secondary unit. And I think that we've already determined that it's maybe beyond clarification, adjusting it so that it fits within 900. I think that they have a plan to do that. Yeah. He's yeah. saying yes. So. Yeah. I, I'm okay if you show both alternatives to that, provided that we know that we have the larger size unit coming down the pipeline. And if he doesn't get to a phase of construction of building it to that till then, then you know, that could be some kind of substantial conformance. I don't know. We have thing. we have to work with the law that we have Correct. in front of us right now. So, understood. Yeah. Understood. Richard, do you know when ADUs are going to be heard? At this time, no, I have not been given a date by the Coastal Commission. I do know they have our application. We've had discussions with them about it, but that's all. Okay. Okay. Chair. Chair. Yes. The, 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 probably the, the most obvious thing here for all of us, Mr. Kent's been coming through these doors for over 20 years. He buys a piece of property here in town. He actually wants to live here. He knows what he has to do. And he's probably going to do it even better because you got to come here before us. So I don't think he's skipped on anything. I don't think he's tried to do something he's not supposed to do. He knows the rules. He knows what he has to do to get this approved. He got, if, if it got tough, he, he went out and got the better people. He spent the money to do this. This wasn't just, the ESHA just all of a sudden came out of anywhere. It's not there. That's why he went through with his, pro hang on, don't you dare say a word. So he went through this and bought that property because it's not mapped ESHA. And Courtney didn't have to go out and look at it, as the director said, because it's already on maps. There is no map for that ESHA. So he has designed accordingly and tried to do everything he can for the, these folks not to take up all their space. This isn't his first time here. He's been doing this for a long time. He knows what to do. And we all know he knows what to do, and he should not be penalized for that. He's done everything right. I, I, I think, yeah, it, momentarily. I think what's on the table is that he's going to get something through. There's just a little bit of a speed bump here. So let's make I, sure I, we do everything right. But it's not, a, it's not a speed bump. Nobody has said exactly that it's ESHA. It is not mapped on a map anywhere. It has been stated in city official communications that this is ESHA. And Man, these guys see, had a change. But don't show me on the map where recognize. Philip let's, said that. Okay, let's, let's, John's got Okay, a, what we are being told right now is, number one, if you're a planning commissioner, you don't have to follow the LIP or the, or the Coastal Act, because the Coastal Act is very clear on how ESH is determined, and it is very clear, it has nothing to do with mapping. Okay, very clear. We're also being told that if you're an architect in this town, you don't have to worry about anything because your planning commissioners are going to say, you know everything and you do everything. Don't you dare interrupt me. And you know everything. So you follow the rules and so we should let you have it. Okay? Now, that is, in my opinion, disqualifies anybody who says that as a planning commissioner disqualifies them right, because guys, they no yeah, longer yeah. follow the law. Now, now you're getting into the ad hominem portion of the, of the show tonight. So, so I move the question. 
are we clear on, on what the motion is? Okay, let's let's call the call Can you, the read roll. It? Can you please read it? I have the motion as um, a continuance to April 15th, 2024, regular planning commission meeting with a request for staff to clarify the presence or lack of presence of ESHA on the site and to clarify the size of the second unit. Does that reflect your motion? Do, do we need to specify, question, do we need to specify that this shall involve the biological experts on both sides? Let's leave it up to staff. Okay. Well, if, if staff doesn't do it, then we'll just bring it up. Yeah. We still have an open hearing. I think that staff was very present at the meeting tonight. And understood yeah, okay. All right. All right, good. Good enough? Let's hear the roll call, please. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Leonard? No. Commissioner Smith? Nope. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. I move we adjourn. All right. Thank you very much, people. You know, I know this is difficult for everybody on all sides. We'll, uh, we have to adjourn. We're, we're, we're adjourning. So thank you. Guys, get it worked out.